Yeah. I call the meeting in order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Prince Gallagher. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Play ball. And tonight, our invocation will be given by Pastor Jim Littleton from the Holly Springs United Methodist Church, and he may tell us a little bit about what's going on over there. A lot of construction people. And welcome back. Hey, thanks for the opportunity to be here, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Yeah, we're in the process of restoring our 100-year-old sanctuary and adding a new narthex to the church. And so far, as, as the mayor indicated, it's going really well. We're trying to maintain a lot of that history of that building, and we're also trying to make it more functional. So, so far, so good. We're hoping to open in October. Uh, the narthex adds about 4,500 feet of functionality, not really seats. Uh, one thing we did in particular that was special, we have 100-year-old pews that are curved. They're curved pews, and you cannot buy curved pews anymore. And we found a company in Clinton, North Carolina, that restores pews. So they came last year and took them all apart and they still have them restoring this old, this old ash wood is what they are. So we, we would have gained more seats if we replaced them, but the church said, no, we want to keep them. So that's something special we're doing and we're excited for what God's doing through the people at our church. And you kept my transom window. Yeah, your transom window is still there. That's right. That's right. MYF 1957. Yeah. <laughs> well, never mind. Thank you. Let, let us pray. Hey, Almighty God, we give thanks for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us this day. We give thanks for a chance to come and meet publicly safely, God, to conduct the business of this community. Lord, we pray for the elected officials of our city. We pray for our first responders. We pray for the many staff that work hard to make Holly Springs a special place. God, tonight we give special thanks also to our parents of all of our children. They work so hard, God, to work, to raise their kids, to send them to school. They're our heroes, God, in our community. And Lord, as our space continues to grow, may we hold on to that culture and that sense of charity that makes Holly Springs a special place. May we continue to love our neighbor as ourself. We ask this in the name of our risen Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Good seeing you again. Thank you, sir. And good luck. Item number five, or item number four, excuse me, is the adjustment approval of the July 18, 2017 meeting agenda, Mayor Pro Tem. Motion to adopt the July 18th meeting agenda with the following changes. Remove from new business item 9E, the MEMS stormwater device project bids, since there were no bids received. Here, second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. That was 9E, right? Okay. Item number five, public comment period. Uh, at this point in time, we have a three-minute uh, section and 15 minutes total, and I have one person signed up. I think I know who this is. Gerald Holloman. You know the drill. <laughs> I, I, Gerald, I didn't do it last time either. We haven't turned, we haven't turned the lights on yet. I think I must have been asleep, but I got a problem. Uh-oh. I see all the Springs didn't have any schools up in about, what, 90, 91, somewhere along there? I forgot when they built Holly the Springs Elementary School. I no, it was, old, it was about I, that. I think about 89. Our school was built here, I guess, closed, school was closed in the 70s. And uh, now I noticed that we got a lot of schools going on here. And we're shipping kids in here from Raleigh and shipping kids that live here to Apex Friendship. Now, what's going on with that? I asked that question, but go ahead. I, I don't understand that. I thought the days of busting students were hopefully over with. I've lived in five states in, in the last uh, first 20 years of my working career. And I moved from North Carolina to South Carolina, and I moved to Michigan. I got to Michigan, and I said, well, we had school districts up there. I said, well, wait till the federal government gets here. They're going to fix this mess. 
Well, guess who they had the rings all around downtown Saginaw? It was the Hispanics and the African Americans. They all boxed in this district. You couldn't cross district lines. They said, oh no, we're gonna get our guns. But anyway, then I came back down here and the same, it's entirely different. Now, what is the difference in living in Michigan and living in North Carolina? I don't understand. And our kids are being bused out of town and we got schools here, a lot of schools, and what, there's something wrong with this, but they tell me they can't get federal money if you don't have a racial balance. I thought we were past that. That's ridiculous. But we're not past that, apparently, with the federal government. So I'm, I'm asking the town council and the mayor and whoever else can to start calling somebody and find out how to stop this mess. Because I don't want my grandchildren bust to Apex Friendship. They, they were born here, they grew up here, they need to stay in school here. That's where everybody lives in this town. Makes no sense to bust somebody to another town and bring people from another town down here. Send them over there. Thank you. We agree. I've already done it Great. once. I'll do it again. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a very good answer then either. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. This point in time, we'll close public hearing and go to agenda item 6A, request communication. Facility update from Wake Med Health and Hospitals. Tom Koff, Wake Med Administrator at the Cary Hospital, and Andy Curtis, who's here too. And I've known Andy for a while. Hi, Andy. Welcome, by the way. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. It is really a pleasure to be here. My name is Tom Goff. I'm the Senior Vice President and Administrator of Wake Med Cary Hospital. I have had the pleasure in the past couple of years, I've been the Administrator there for two years, of meeting several times with the Mayor, and I think I've met with uh, Councilman O'Brien once, but this is the first chance I've had to address the full Council, so it's really a pleasure. Your residents are our patients, so we have so much in common, and there are so many uh, residents of Holly Springs that work at our Wake Med Cary Hospital and throughout the Wake Med system that we really have a lot in common. The other thing we have in common, just to state the obvious, is just as you are growing as a town at a really phenomenal rate, we are growing at an exponential rate as a healthcare system. So I'm happy tonight to share with you just a couple of updates about things that are going on within the Wake Med system. Uh, the first is really just a general slide. I think most of you know, but we are the largest provider of healthcare services in Wake County. Uh, largest if you count numbers of providers and number of distinct facilities. We have three main hospitals. Uh, the one that you probably know uh, most uh, uh, up north uh, a few miles in Cary. We also have a facility in Raleigh, which is a tertiary facility with close to 600 beds. It functions as Wake County's uh, only level one trauma center for really seriously injured uh, patients from within the county. And then we have a relatively new hospital, two years old now in North Raleigh, that started as a women's hospital and now is a full service hospital serving that market. We have a couple of specialty hospitals, the, um, both of them in Raleigh. One is our rehab hospital. The rehab hospital is located on New Bern Avenue and it serves a distinct population of people that have traumatic brain injuries, that have spinal cord injuries, that have had strokes and other neurological conditions and it's very specialized in the care that it provides. And then we also have, as probably you know, uh, Wake County's only children's hospital in Raleigh, which we're really proud of, along with a children's emergency room, which is very unique. Um, and not many e exist actually throughout the country other than in really large metropolitan areas. So we're excited about um, the unique expertise that that facility has as well. And then we also have a series of what we call health plexes. There are four in total, Apex, Briar Creek, Garner, um, are our largest and they um, serve basically as sort of freestanding emergency rooms and urgent care centers and they're generally co-located with a bunch of doctor's offices in those communities and the thought there being to continue as Wake County grows with all of its towns and cities to bring health care as close as we can to the residents to, to cut down drive times and make health care convenient and then finally we have um, a large medical staff on each of our three uh, major campuses, but we have um, over 50 different physician offices throughout Wake County, multi-specialty primary care and specialists and surgeons. And um, the slide that's up for the audience says 200 plus physicians, but it's actually close to 300 physicians that we now employ and a very large number of independent doctors that work at all of our facilities as well. So 
as a, as a healthcare system, as you know, we're nonprofit. We exist for the people and by the people. So we're constantly taking a look at our own planning data, just like you look at planning data uh, at the town level, trying to figure out how do the services that we offer match up with the needs of the population, the needs of the population that lives here and the needs of the populations that are moving into the cities and towns that we serve. Um, and that is a big part of our mission. Within Wake Med Carry, um, I think you're probably aware we're a full service hospital. There's very few things that we don't offer. We're now 25 plus years old. We started small, but we've continued to add, uh, particularly in the past couple of years, to the breadth and scope of services that we offer. Um, we have a large uh, birthing center, we call it Women's Birthplace and Pavilion, that not only offers uh, maternity services, but also offers um, the full service of mammography and bone density and uh, pelvic floor therapy, which is for folks that have incontinence, uh, lymphedema treatment, a variety of services, both inpatient and outpatient, that serve the needs of women. We have um, a level three neonatal intensive care unit for those babies that are very sick, um, staffed uh, full-time 24-7, 365 with neonatologists so that we can care for babies that are born 32 weeks to 40 weeks and have special needs. And then we also wrap around that service a set of physicians that are called maternal fetal medicine doctors, and they are specially trained in women that are um, uh, designated up front as having potentially high risk or actually high risk births based on um, their um, uh, personal uh, health conditions. So for example, somebody that has type two diabetes is at risk, their baby for having some potential complications if they're not taken care of in utero and those types of doctors shepherd them along the way and make certain that they're uh, getting the best uh, care possible to maximize the outcome at birth. We have a 12-bed intensive care unit. It is staffed around the clock with critical care medicine doctors. These are doctors that are specially trained in taking care of patients that are extraordinarily sick. We have um, medical and surgical beds. We have a cardiac intensive care unit. We have what we call a step-down unit or intermediate care unit for people who have really complex surgeries and need not quite to go to an ICU, but need uh, uh, close to ICU level care. And then we have a whole cadre of outpatient services because that's really where a lot of care is moving to the outpatient setting. So many of the things that I saw 30 years ago when I started my career as a healthcare administrator, um, and like the gentleman before me, I've worked in six different states around the country from the Midwest to the Mid-Atlantic to New England to now the South. And uh, as care gets more advanced, more and more of it is being provided in the outpatient setting, in one-day settings or in walk-in settings. So there's a huge um, growth within the Wake Med Cary campus and all around uh, our service area, including here in Holly Springs and towns that we serve in trying to put outpatient services that people no longer need to go to the hospital for. Um, a big one uh, that we focused on a lot in the last year is cardiology and specifically um, vascular services or what they call peripheral vascular services. So I think you're probably aware a lot of folks when they get a blockage in their heart, they come in, they get a stent to uh, get rid of the occlusion. That same phenomena happen can happen in any artery or vein within your body. And so we have a brand new vascular lab within Wake Med Carry Hospital that prevents people from needing to go uh, to Raleigh for that type of care where we can put stents in any of your arteries or veins throughout your body or do what we call ablations, which is remove some of the plaque or the atherosclerosis that builds up in arteries and veins without having to put a stent in. So that's a really um, important service for you to know about because it is the case if you look at incidence and prevalence that when we get to 65 years old, 25 to 30 for, to 30% of us will have some kind of PAD, peripheral arterial disease, a blockage in our veins and arteries, unless we had a really healthy diet throughout our prior years and, and did a lot of exercise and had good genes to boot. Um, so that is a great service that we now offer to Holly Springs and to all of the communities that we serve. We also have a really unique partnership that you've probably seen on the news or probably um, in um, other media outlets, which is a collaboration with Duke Health System. So we have really um, taken a look at two areas, hearts and oncology in particular, and ways that we can collaborate in the space that we operate. So um, we are two not-for-profit health systems. We are not merging or getting together in any kind of formal legal sense, but we each, when we got together, believed that we could make each other's services better by joining our forces and thinking about how we could fill in gaps in care. Uh, we are within hearts, for example, the largest provider within Wake County. We do more heart procedures and see more, more heart related patients, both inpatient and outpatient than any other provider. Um, 
more than either of the two other systems. Uh, and um, yet the Duke Health System didn't have much of a presence in Wake County. And likewise in oncology, they are the market leader within not just Wake County and North Carolina, but they're one of the top five providers in the country within the oncology space. And so we thought we could make oncology services better for the residents in all of the areas that we serve within Wake County, not just Western Wake County by collaborating with them. So you'll be hearing more about that partnership, but it's really unique. I think you're gonna see more of this in the healthcare field where you know, all three systems again are nonprofit where we go beyond the traditional competitive boundaries and think about ways we can make things better for patients, how we can provide services that, that are of higher quality, how we can improve patient experience, and how we can provide um, less expensive services by getting together in some areas, still competing in others, but getting together in, in, in a number of areas. So uh, more to come on that. There are a number of advanced services that we offer at Wake Med Carey Hospital. Most of these did not exist when we started 25 years ago. These aren't in any particular order, but um, uh, hip and knee replacements, orthopedics is something that we do a lot of. We are a designated center of excellence by every accrediting body out there, certainly by Blue Cross and United and Cigna and all the major health plans. They look at our quality data and compare us to um, other facilities and try to identify those that they think are in the top 10%, and that's something orthopedics that we do really well. We also are a designated center of excellence in the space of bariatrics. So as we all know, folks, um, uh, many folks decide after weight loss therapy if they are really um, uh, challenged with weight loss issues to have bariatric surgery. And we have a total of eight physician surgeons on our staff that do bariatric surgery. That's not a first resort for people, but it is an option for many people to try to improve their lifestyle and more importantly to reduce other comorbidities, diseases that they have because uh, weight loss surgery can in fact change your entire life and remediate a lot of other healthcare conditions that you have. So we are really good at that. Uh, we do about 600 procedures a year. Um, maternity care is something that we're a designated center of excellence in. We have within the wake med system, the sixth lowest rate of C-sections in the entire country. So one of our goals that you've probably heard our CEO, Donald Ginzik talk about is our goal within the wake med system is not just to continue to strive to be the best for patients and residents in the towns and cities that we serve in Wake County, but to be top 10 in the United States. And um, we have a ways to go in many areas, but maternity service is not one of them. We're already the sixth lowest uh, C-section rate in the county. It's a 16% and the national average is in the 35% range. So you have about half of much chance if you go to one of the Wake Med facilities of having a C-section as you do if you go somewhere else. And that's something that we're really <laughs> proud of because more and more women want to have a natural birth if in fact they can. Uh, we're an accredited stroke center. So again, as the population er, uh, ages and more and more folks have strokes, we are designated as a stroke center, which means we've held ourselves to a national accrediting body that comes in and really looks at the way that patients who get stroke care are taken care of, our outcomes, our preventative services, how quickly we get people TPA, which is what unblocks uh, the occlusion in your brain. Um, Everything from what happens in the field when EMS picks you up at your house or your workplace or wherever you may be having a stroke and brings you to the hospital to everything that happens when you leave the hospital. So we're really proud of stroke care. Chest pain is another area. So um, many folks have chest pain. Some of them are having a heart attack, some of them not. We're a designated center of excellence in trying to quickly make that determination and get people to the right point of care general surgery, spine surgery for folks that have back problems, orthopedics, primary care, pulmonary and sleep medicine. Sleep medicine is probably worth talking about. We're one of the only uh, regional sleep labs in the area. We're accredited by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, which is a big deal. That's an um, organization that really looks at how you're taking care of people with sleep problems, which believe it or not, it afflict probably 30, 35% of us uh, to different degrees, and it can affect your entire health if you don't get enough sleep. So um, we have a center of excellence in Cary available that serves probably people from, we get people from uh, as far away as 60, 70, 80 miles away coming to that center. Thoracic surgery is something that's brand new at Wake Med Cary. It didn't exist even three months ago. It exists today uh, with a thoracic surgeon. So people who have lung nodules or have cancer of the lung, they were uh, smokers all their life, or maybe not smokers, but they just got lung cancer. You can, in fact, get lung cancer without being a smoker. Um, now have a resource locally, and again, we're trying to provide um, really high quality care as close to people's homes as we possibly can. 
Um, urology, vascular surgery is again a relatively new service within the wake med carry system. Endocrinology for folks, folks that have uh, diabetes or other metabolic conditions. Um, the whole suite of cardiology services, folks that need pacemakers, folks that need defibrillators, folks that have um, arrhythmias that don't need devices, and folks that have um, arteries and veins that need to be unblocked. All of that we offer at Wake Med Carry. And then gastroenterology, we have a whole set of new services this year that didn't exist at any time in the past for a variety of conditions that afflict our stomachs, our intestines, our pancreas, our liver, et cetera, and some specialized doctors that didn't exist to take care of those. So this is my really long-winded way of saying that we have a lot of new services. And like I said, just as you're growing, so are we trying to bring services close to people's homes. Um, I won't bore you with details, but we invite some 30 different accrediting organizations into Wake Med Carry. So we may think are good, we're good, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is trying to bring independent national people who are experts in all the different disease etiologies into Wake Med to sort of validate, are we doing the, what we should with different patient populations and how can we do a better job? And a big part of what they do when they come in, usually for a week at a time, is to share best practices from around the country so that we're learning here in North Carolina and in Wake County uh, and in Western Wake uh, about the best practices that are going on on the West Coast, on the East Coast, in, this, in other parts of the South, in New England, et cetera. Um, nursing excellence, we're one of only a few um, systems in the area that are magnet designation for nurses. So what that means is all of the nurses at Wake Med System, regardless of where they work, have committed to um, certifications and degrees that are advanced. And so they have extra training beyond that which the traditional nursing staff have. Um, I talked about stroke and cardiac care and bariatric imaging. We do a lot of imaging. Um, we are designated center of excellence for just about every type of imaging or x-ray study that you could possibly have. That makes a big difference because the two main venues through which people get diagnosed are through various types of x-rays, images, and through lab tests. <laughs> so those are really important modalities to be good at. And then the last thing as I opened is we have roughly 1,200 people, just shy of 1,200 people at Wake Med Cary, and yet we have over 100 people at Wake Med Cary who live in the town of Holly Springs, and we have um, close to 270 within our system who work at different Wake Med facilities. So we're not only proud of the fact that we are constantly looking out for the healthcare needs of the people who live in Holly Springs, but we're proud of the fact that so many of your residents have taken up employment in our facility and are helping to provide care, not just to the residents of Holly Springs, but to the rest of the folks in Western Wade County. And um, the last statistic I had on the slide was we, we treated, it says almost 5,400 patients in our emergency room, specifically from Holly Springs just in the last year. And that's a lot. We see about 45,000 visits to our emergency room. That's not including all the outlying urgent cares, but just in the carry facility emergency room. And a very large portion of them are folks from Holly Springs. So um, we're happy that, um, that you all have trusted us for your care for so many uh, years. We're gonna continue to strive to work with all the different facets of the town to think about how we can keep people in Holly Springs and other parts of our service area healthy. We're working with the town um, Parks and Recreation Department to bring a new uh, program to uh, children in Holly Springs called the Energize Program. It's a weight management program to keep kids um, fit and, and uh, in the right uh, um, body mass index so that they get less health problems as they get older and into their adult years. And it's those types of preventative services that are really the future. The hospital is a place you hope you don't want to wind up, um, but if you do, we're ready for you. But the real focus of our continued efforts, both here in your town and in other towns, is really outreach to keep people healthy through their primary care doctor and through creative programs um, with other town and city departments. So I am happy to answer questions if you have them about Wake Med Carry or just the Wake Med system in general. Any questions? You covered it pretty thoroughly, I think. All right. Actually, you, you have a lot of, um, a lot of services mm. in a number of locations, uh, which I think is fantastic, especially so close to us. Um, however, if I'm in the ER or one of these, mm. at a, having a um, procedure done, when you hear the tech or the nurse say, the doctor will be right in, to me that means 30 to 60 minutes. What's being done at Wake Med to, uh, to limit or reduce wait times? Yeah, a lot. We have a whole set of systems that we have adopted 
uh, a system uh, that the Toyota manufacturing folks have developed um, that is looking at lean process management and how we can move um, the flow of patients along faster and eliminate waste inefficiencies in time and other things. The average time at WakeMed carry uh, for a patient from the, we call it door to dock, from the time you walk in the emergency room to when you see a doctor is 32 minutes. Um, we'd like to do a lot better than that. I think what you're going to see going forward is more and more emergency rooms are going to eliminate the traditional triage function where you, you come to the waiting room, you see the nurse from triage, you go back into the waiting room and you sit and then you go into a bay when you get called. Um, there's, uh, that triage function can really occur, if you think about it, that's like an extra step in the bay when you get to the back, right? Mm -hmm. So that's really our goal. And I think um, I am extraordinarily sensitive as the head of Wake Med Carry, and I can tell you the rest of our um, practitioners are to the fact that the co-pays and the co-insurance amounts for people, myself included, <laughs> um, when you go to the emergency room, right, it used to be like 10, 15, 25 bucks, I'm dating myself, and now it's like uh, 75, 100, we see people with 200, $250 co-pays, it's a big deal to go to the emergency room. So you not only want really expert care, but you want the very best service that you can get, and a big part of that is wait times. Um, you know, I think increasingly you'll see that the old, way of waiting four, five, six hours from the time you walk in the door to the time that you leave is going to become the thing of the past. And I can tell you that every system is working on trying to improve that. And I, what you know already is the fact that we're really blessed in Western Wake County and in Wake County in general with three big systems, all of them, you know, that's a good thing. It's choices for consumers and it's forces everybody to up their game and to think about how do we improve quality? How do we improve service? Wait times just being one dimension. And, and how do we provide the, the least expensive care at a high quality? And that's, that's a good thing for all of us. So I hope they never have to take advantage of your improvements. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Um, well, I, I'm a former um, employee of Wake Med Carrier. I worked in the ER there for 10 years Super. as a patient rep. And uh, back then, it was the place to go. And, I mean, Apex was built towards the end of my time there. Um, and so that's where everybody went. It was closest. And now that there's more competition coming, what uh, I, a lot you have a lot of new services and things like that. So what is Wake Med going to do to? I, I mean, people are still going to go there mm. because of the loyalty. So what is Wake Med going to do to keep these patients and and to keep people, um, you know, coming back and choosing Wake Med for their health care? I think it's twofold. I think part of it is developing a relationship with people to keep them healthy. So hopefully we're getting more and more away as an industry. And certainly I think all the facilities in Wake County, this is a huge focus of Wake Meds, is um, not providing episodic care, waiting till you come in and you're sick, but trying to keep you healthy in your home environment or in your town or city. Um, the other part of it is really just about... Um, matching up our quality and our outcomes to the best in class within the country. So I think one big difference from 10 years ago, I know myself, is that more and more consumers are getting savvy about going online and looking up the quality and the cost of care. And I see that as a really good thing for the WakeMed system because we'll put our quality scores and our outcomes and we'll definitely put our... Um, our value proposition in terms of the cost up against anybody and you know there, it used to be that people would ask their neighbor and I'm not saying that doesn't happen anymore or look at a billboard or see something in a magazine more and more people are going online and there is a ton of information out there if you want if you have uh, chronic heart failure you have uh, any sort of chronic condition diabetes pick anything you need surgery you need a hip or a knee replacement uh, you need cardiovascular care um, you, ha um, you have hypertension. No matter what you pick, you can go online and through, you know, as you probably know, you know, 10 different publicly reportable data sources, find out how the WakeMed system stacks up to the Duke system, stacks up to the UNC system, and that is data that I hope more and more people will be looking at because we, we, we fare really well in that. And that makes for more informed consumers. And I tell people, our best, our best um, clientele, the patients that use our system, are the ones that take the time to do that research. People owe it to themselves, and it's a good, it's... And when you have choices, you need to do that. Yes, you do, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Tom, just uh, first off, thank you for putting yourself up there to, to, to uh, allow us to, to ask you these questions. Um, you have 100 employees, uh, uh, carry employees here in Holly Springs. You've got 267 Wake Med employees here. Uh, looking at the map that you showed earlier, there's a, you'll have, you have a presence in Apex, you have a presence in Garner. 
but there's nothing really down here in Holly Springs, Fuquay, this particular lower end of, of the county. Are there any plans to expand your presence here in, in this particular area? Because we are a very growing, vibrant section of the county and wait times include time it takes for me to get from my home to your facility. Yes, about 20 minutes, right? Yeah, so, Give or take. <laughs> it, yeah, right. Um, there absolutely are. We have a number of um, facilities, primary care offices and specialist offices in Fuquay, and we are in the process of um, continuing to expand into Holly Springs and other contiguous towns. We have a number of primary care offices and obstetrical offices um, that are in the works for Holly Springs proper. Yeah, so I think you'll see more and more of a presence in this area, and that's just a natural outgrowth of the population growth and our continued desire to bring care as close to people's home as we can. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And sometimes that 20 minute drive can be 30 or 40. I know that myself. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. That's it? Yep. Thank you much. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Thank Tom. You, sir. Thank you. Agenda item 6B request communication stage work theater of Holly Springs, Dan Barth. Hi again. Good How you doing? I'm good. Nice to see you again, Mr. Mayor. Good. Same Thank Mayor. you, committee. Thank you for the time tonight. So uh, not like the predecessor, I had this wonderful deck prepared as well, and the entire thing crashed on me. So instead of a, a performance set in rehearsal, I'm going to improv the entire thing and see how it goes, okay? okay. <laughs> so I am Dan Barth. I relocated to the Triangle about six years ago from New Hampshire, uh, having done 25 to 30 years of local theater in the New England area before coming here, and set out to find where the theater opportunities were here in the Triangle and traveled to many places and landed in a meeting here in 2014 at the Cultural Center where there was interest in starting to stage live theater again. So we put on a show called A Bad Year for Tomatoes in fall of uh, 2014. Maybe some of you saw it. And that played very well. We had 300 hand up. Yes, good. Audience member, fantastic. All right. Keep that in mind because there's more of that coming as we go here, okay? Uh, we had 300 plus people for the show. It was very clear that, that theater would have play here in Holly Springs if we started to organize it. So we continued this journey forward. And we've actually done five shows up until this point. That was followed by a show called All in the Timing by David Ives, a set of five one acts set to comedy. And then two shows by a writing team called Hope Jones and Wooten. The first one was the Dixie Swim Club. The second was uh, Always a Bridesmaid. That gets us more to current day here. Always a Bridesmaid was not too long ago. Finally, we also staged an original murder mystery that I wrote myself called Holly Springs Got Talent and Murder in a dessert theater that sold out for two performances. And I'm happy to say that's going to have a command performance again this coming September on the 29th and 30th of the month with three big shows, including a matinee on Saturday afternoon. So this head of steam was clearly showing us that there was a, a taste for live theater in Holly Springs. And I think there'd been some history and some dabbling and groups had come and gone, but we continued focused. And, and by the time uh, 2016 was rolling around, Kathleen Abair and I sat down and started to form a, a real plan to go after this thing. So that was the birth of this newly formed Stageworks Theater of Holly Springs, which we started to organize at that point and start to plan our first full season, which I am very excited to announce kicks off this September. September with four shows running through next summer. We actually already have some light planning in place for season two because we know we're going to kill it season one. So there'll be all this call for additional follow-up there. Our four shows coming up are God's Favorite by Neil Simon, uh, not one of his overly known shows, but a very funny show about the story of Job from the Old Testament set in modern day with a lot of comedy attached to it. You'll enjoy it very much. And then there were none by Agatha Christie, which is probably her, her best known mystery to date. A show called Whose Life Is It Anyway by an author named Brian Clark, which is not often done, but a dramatic and very thought provoking piece. And finally, we're going to circle back to that good Southern Fried comedy with Hope Jones and Wooten with a show called Mama Won't Fly. Now, to this point, uh, I've been the director of the first five shows. We're spreading the wealth going into our season. And we formed a board around this initiative at this juncture because we're going to get a lot more done if we have more hands on deck, right? So seven of my colleagues and friends and, and fellow thespians joined me. Uh, I should denote that some are from a theatrical background, some are from a business background, because boards work well when you have a, a mixed basis of education and knowledge and, and background. So we've been hard at it getting the season going. We have planted a season subscription package at that actually we did a uh, kickoff called our Overture Season, which was made up of the two Hopes, Joan and, and Hope Jones and Wooten shows 
the murder mystery and finding patients just to test the waters to see if a subscription package would work. And we sold about 20 in about a month, which was a pretty good start for us. I'm very excited to say that with about a month and a half of a few public outings so far, we have 50 season sick tickets sold already for the first season uh, with the goal of 100 well in sight. And I think we'll probably go well beyond that as things move forward. Um, we are excited to have the season ticket in place, and we're looking forward to getting more of a word of our company out to folks in not only this area, but all the surrounding communities as well. So we have a Facebook page set up now. If you just go and look up StageWorks, it's one word. You'll find us there. We have a web presence now on the Town of Holly Springs website. Same thing, you can go in and search there. Tickets can be bought on etix.com. Uh, via search for either the Holly Springs Cultural Center or the name of the show. You can also just show up at the desk over at the Cultural Center and you can do either individual tickets or the season tickets. And the season tickets, it's my one artifact I do have with me, is a form that you can find online if you go in there. And to kick off our first season, all four shows, it's only $40 for all four. I don't think you're gonna find a better entertainment uh, budget or, or value in the triangle at this point. So our goal is to put forward excellence in theater. We've got a nice mixed first season coming up with a couple of comedies and a mystery and a drama. We'll do the same format and flavor going into season two. And what we need to do at this point is now start to engage the community, engage the leaders of the community and, and the members of the community to help spread the word about us. One thing that was evident as we've done some of our public outings so far is that people still aren't quite sure who we are. They've seen a couple of the shows, but they're not really aware of our name or our presence or what's going on so we're making a strong effort to get that word out but you know how this works if we can press through the town and other folks who are here that that will help our cause um, we're wide open and and accepting everyone coming in who wants to get involved a couple of our board members do live here in Holly Springs the rest of us are made up of other neighboring communities and we have encouraged uh, Theater goers of all types to come see us. We've encouraged all artists to come in. We've got open calls for auditions. We'll be publishing all that as we move forward. So I think that the biggest things, just to recap, I guess, is we want to start to get known among the businesses. We did have two major sponsors in our, our first uh, overture season, if you will. MyComputerCareer.edu got behind us for one big show, and uh, the Main Street Dentistry Group got behind us for one big show, and a couple of ads along the way as well. So as we grow our, our subscription base and our audience base, it's an excellent way for local business to advertise through us. And then we also want to be pushing the opportunity to get uh, more people to come out and support us in different ways. So, so one thing that we'll be looking forward to in building as we get going here is some of the infrastructure that, that's secured and, and local groups have to have to be successful down the road. Uh, it's wonderful to have the space and it's wonderful to have the situation we have. We need to get to storage capabilities at some point. We need to be able to pull in certain amounts of props and, and materials to build sets. You, you don't want to have to do everything from scratch every time you do a show. It gets very expensive that way. So as we progress, we'll be looking at those avenues. The, the board that we formed is trying to be very self-sufficient in pushing our name out, but we are working in partnership at the same time with Kathleen and any entity that's willing to talk with us and work with us to continue to spread this wonderful new local theater coming here to Holly Springs. I think in a nutshell, that was the presentation. For improv, not too bad, huh? Sounded like it to me. Questions? Comments? No, you winged it well. Great. Thank you. So we'll look Just forward to a, seeing you all, right? Get a little more enthusiasm, if you would. A little bit? Yeah. A little more enthusiasm? Yeah, a little more. All right. Well, come see the show. I'm in the next show. I get a lot of enthusiasm. You'll see it all on stage. All right? Thank you. All right. Thank Appreciate you. it. Looking thank forward you. to it. Thank you. Agenda item 6C, Request Communication, Holly Springs Chamber of Commerce Communications, Scott Manning, Chamber Director. Hi, Scott. Good, how are you? Fantastic. You're looking good. To good. see you all. Um, I want to begin by thanking the council for their uh, renewed support of the chamber for 2017, 2018. We truly could not do it um, without your support and we appreciate it and we think that um, we are fantastic stewards of the investment you all choose to make in our initiatives. So we thank you for that. Um, back in the fall of 2015, the Chamber created a Sports and Leisure Task Force with the specific intent of bringing Sports and Leisure Tourism um, to Holly Springs. A l outcome from that was the North, uh, National Club Baseball Association World Series. Um, I saw many of you at the games. It was a fantastic event. Um, I want to thank those people that were part of the local organizing committee, 
Um, everyone from Justin Sellers from the Coastal Plain League, Tommy Atkinson with the Salamanders, Teresa Tyler with the Greater Raleigh Sports Alliance, Travis Kelly with Zaxby's, Wayne Holt with 919 Beer, John Dolpy with Rodney Signs, and Lynn Bradley, Adam Huffman, and Danny Loveless with Holly Springs Parks and Rec. We could not have had a better team um, to, to be assembled to bring this tournament to Holly Springs. Um, so Lynn, I know you're here. Adam, thank you guys so much um, for your support in that. Um, it was a, a fun week. We had everything from uh, vulture effigies and uh, everything, everything in between. So it was, it was a great, a great week for Holly Springs. Our town bird. Our town bird, right, yes. right. Um, I also want to thank the hometown support from a sponsorship perspective. Um, GMA Supply was our presenting sponsor for the tournament. Um, we, without their financial support, I think things would have been a little bit different. Um, so I know Sean is here. Thank you very much um, for GMA's support, as well as um, Zaxby's and the Mason Jar Tavern were both um, sponsors of that event, um, as well as Rodney's signs for designing um, the banners. So from a numbers perspective, we had 227 players and coaches travel to Holly Springs from Michigan, Utah, Nevada, Texas, Colorado, Florida, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. Um, from a spectator attendance, it was 2,773, and the majority of those were outside of Holly Springs and outside of, of Wake County. Um, a, a, another number is 519. That's the total number of room nights that this tournament brought. Uh, unfortunately, not to Holly Springs. Um, they brought those 519 were taken care of by Cary. Um, so from a wants and needs analysis, I think that supports a need for another hotel in Holly Springs. Um, I, was, I just came from a topping off ceremony for a new Homewood Suites in Cary. Um, I would love to attend a topping off celebration for a new hotel in Holly Springs. So um, I think those numbers support it. I think what you will see from the Coastal Plain League in their all-star game um, will support um, the need for um, a, another hotel in um, Holly Springs. I do want to read um, a comment from Christian Smith, who's the VP of Baseball Operations. Um, the Greater Raleigh Sports Alliance, of course, sends a survey out to the groups and ask them to rate everything from the airport to the facility. Um, and this is what he had to say about North Main Athletic Complex. He said, it's the best facility we have ever used for any of our national championships. We felt honored to be able to have our signature event in such an amazing facility. Parents, teams, and staff alike were blown away by how awesome it was. We are under contract for 2018, but hope to make Holly Springs and North Main Athletic Complex a permanent home for the D1 World Series. It is truly a gem and we feel honored to be able to use it. So straight from Christian Smith. Um, we certainly look forward um, to 2018 and hope that we can uh, find a way to make um, a long-term agreement work. On the same um, tourism perspective, I've actually been asked to serve on the steering committee for the Greater Raleigh Convention and Visitors Bureau as they formulate the 10-year strategic plan for tourism in Wake County. So it's gonna be a 13 month process um, and I look forward to representing Holly Springs in that endeavor. There's gonna be about 15 of us, uh, local leaders from all across Wake County. So it should be a fun 13 month process, hopefully. Um, moving along, a great collabor collaboration that we have with the town is Center Street Market. Um, that's been going on since May. Um, it's been amazing to see the growth that we've um, experienced not only from interested vendors, but also people coming to the market. Um, this year we had 57 applicants, um, some for individual months, some seasonal. Um, from a social media perspective, uh, we have 451 Facebook likes for the Center Street Market um, page, 457 followers, and the posts from this week, so getting everyone to come to Center Street Market and the Farmer's Market, reached almost 3,400 um, people. So the word is spreading. We have a wait list for all months. Um, we have a five-star review status. And um, I just wanna read one comment uh, from one of our vendors. I had a blast at Center Street Market this past Saturday. I had my highest sales day ever. The Holly Springs market community seemed to connect with and appreciate my handmade craft goods and I was able to get my business cards in many, many hands. I'm eager to come back in October if you can find me a spot. So interesting and fun collaboration that we're doing with the town um, to really have an impact 
on small business in Holly Springs. So we, we love that collaboration. Um, on the note of collaboration, we are working with the Apex and Fuquay Verena Chambers of Commerce to host the first ever Southwest Wake Community Festival. It's gonna be on September 9th. It's a Saturday and it's going to be at Hope Community Church. That is sponsored by UNC Rex Healthcare. Um, and just as a side, I know the Wake Med folks have left, but when they talk about collaboration, um, between Wake Med, UNC, Rex Hospital, and Duke, I mean, it is evident all across the board. When, and when I interact with them outside of Holly Springs, um, they are fantastic to work with. In this instance, UNC Rex Healthcare, Healthcare is gonna help um, sponsor that initiative. It's both a community family festival as well as being able to highlight local businesses. So we're more than 50% sold out um, from a business standpoint, and we'll have food trucks and a little kids area some more to come on that. Additionally, uh, the chamber is in the process um, of finalizing our um, chamber foundation. So we're forming a 501c3. Um, we have all of our paperwork into the IRS and we're just waiting on their determination letter, which should come shortly, uh, to celebrate the Chamber Foundation October 13th through 16th. This is going to be Fall Foundation Weekend. Um, that'll take place at Devil's Ridge. We'll have a casino night and silent auction on Friday the 13th. And then on that Monday, we'll host our Gold Star Education Golf Tournament. Um, that is on the 16th. Uh, and those funds raised will benefit the Holly Springs Chamber Foundation. We formed the foundation because we realized that there are certain initiatives within the chamber that really should be um, underneath the umbrella of a, a charitable foundation, specifically our educational and our workforce development initiatives. So we look forward to transitioning some of the current programming that falls underneath the chamber umbrella over to the foundation umbrella and really expanding um, our impact on the Holly Springs community from an education and workforce development um, perspective. Finally, um, on your agenda for this evening is an ordinance 17-07. Uh, the chamber um, urges the council to adopt that ordinance. Uh, this week we circulated a letter with our hospitality members and those signing on to it are um, Texas Roadhouse, Hickory Tavern, Homegrown Pizza, the Mason Jar Tavern, Devil's Ridge Golf Club, the Club at 12 Oaks, Niche Wine Lounge, Sit Bistro, and um, My Way Tavern, Fiesta Mexicana, Los Posts, Bombshell Beer Company, and Carolina Brewing Company. So I sent that all to your inboxes this morning. I know you all received it, so Good. we look forward um, to that. And I do, I do have a, some perspective on that um, from Jonathan Pierce at the Mason Jar Tavern. He says, um, with the passage of Ordinance 17-01, if we alters, alter our hours on Sunday, that stretches the average day for our cooks and servers. This makes it more likely that we will need to hire another couple of cooks to cover prep, line cook positions, and servers. If we do not decide to add more positions, our team would likely get overtime pay and servers would be making more, raising household income in our community. So there is a measurable impact that I think this ordinance will have. Um, and the chamber, on behalf of our restaurant members and hospitality members, just urges the council to pass that ordinance this evening. So any questions? Just to follow up on your comment about the uh, uh, Salamander game. Yes, sir. The stadium. During the... Um, Ting Park. Well, Ting Park now, yes, of course. Excuse me. Um, during the All-Star game, which we had here, one of the teams that came in had four or five members from the Savannah Bananas, mm -hmm. my favorite team. Mm -hmm. I love that name. And they were all dressed in yellow, so I went down and talked to them and said, what do you think of the stadium? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? One of the best they've ever seen. I said, how, how is the hospitality between all the people around here with you guys? Terrific. So I felt very good that a team from Savannah came all the way up here, really enjoyed their visit to Holly Springs. And I think that's a a commendation to everybody who had anything to do with it. So. Totally, I agree. And I'm look for, looking forward to more of these events. That thank you know, thanks to your mm -hmm. your committee. I think sure. uh, it's uh, certainly a testament to uh, your hard work, and then also the fact that um, the North Main Athletic Complex Ting Park mm -hmm. was the the right decision that this council right. made to to build that. I agree. Really Anything else for Scott? And I, I do agree on the hotel mm -hmm. I think it's, it would we're, be we're getting that, to that point now yes so. 
There's been some discussion, but that's I'm sure. Yeah. Great. And the uh, championship game was phenomenal. Uh, I, the crowd, uh, ECU fans, they were, it was awesome. They are a uh, fantastic team from a fan support perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think without ECU being in that tournament, I don't think we would have had the same amount of the turnout. Um, but I don't know, and I don't care because it was great. So and the end were, <laughs> it was when fantastic. The, their coach was like six foot seven and giving Sean uh, Mayeski a hug. I mean, that was right. That was it so was fun. you have to understand that with club baseball, I mean, these kids are truly playing the game for the passion and the love of the game. Yeah. They're not playing after college. So to play in a facility like North Main Athletic Complex is the culmination and the pinnacle of their baseball career. Um, and for us to be able to play a part, a small part in that in their lives is is fantastic. Yeah. So, and I was told that for all those ECU games, there was not a drop of beer left at the end of the night. <laughs> you know, was, uh, you ran out of beer and you ran out of food. Um, so, luckily, there's plenty of that in Holly Springs. So, it, we weren't weren't for that, out that for long. But they're good so. problems to have. They can they can be fixed. That's right. It's like the mayor says. I'd rather have the problems that no food and beer. I mean, growth has <laughs> no, no, than, no. <laughs> than no growth. You're has. right the first time. What's right, that? right. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Great. Looking forward to the future endeavors. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Good working you, with you and the chamber. Agenda item 7A, public hearing, annexation A1701-4034, Berman Edge Road property, and it's Gina Clapp. Good evening. Good evening. We have a voluntary annexation petition this evening for public hearing, and it is for just under 16 acres on Berman Edge Road, and you're wondering where is Berman Edge Road. Um, you have Avent Ferry Road is down here. This is the Morgan Park subdivision here, and the logging road, and the fire station is just off the screen. It is tucked in back here. Um, several months ago, we did a rezoning to rezone this property to R10CU, and this evening there's a subdivision being requested for this property. So in um, connection with that subdivision request, they're requesting voluntary annexation to receive access to town utilities, and it is contiguous to our town limits and meets all statutory requirements for annexation. I hear a bell, or is it just me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little worried. <laughs> no, no problem. Any questions of Gina at this point? Gina? No. Good. All right, Gina, thank you. It is a public uh, hearing. At this point in time, open the uh, public hearing. And I want to say, Christy, I want to say your last name right, so you may have to help me. Christy Mercies? Mercies. Well, that's close. Please come forward, state your name and your address, please. And you have up to three minutes, please. Up here, yes, please. Thank you. You got it. Okay, thank you much. Christy Macias, 204 Utley Bluffs Drive, Holly Springs. I live in Morgan Park. I am a brand new resident to Holly Springs as of a few months ago. So first off, I want to thank you guys so much for allowing myself to speak as well as my wonderful row of folks over there that also come from Morgan Park. So I was speaking for all of us. We know your agenda's tight. We get it. So um, high level, and if we can just, can we throw that map back up for a second? I want to do that if I can, because while I don't have, sorry, <laughs> while I don't have a PowerPoint, I do think it's important to highlight a few things. And I think sure. the, the biggest reason why we are here tonight yeah. is one, if, thank you so much, is one, if we can say a thank you in one uh, sense, and another is gonna be in a nice way information and another is going to be an ask. So I warn you all now that there is an agenda in my head. All right, so first thing first. So if you look at where this property is, if I can kind of come over here a little bit, you're going to kind of see that I live right here. So you're going to say, oh, Christy has something here she wants to talk to us about because her property comes right next to this new subdivision. That's correct and that's a fact. I knew that when I bought my house four months ago. So I'm not here to talk to you about the zoning or anything to complain about that. Just want to make sure that's very clear. What I do want to talk to you about are a few of the things. Um, one, since we have moved in, myself and my fellow neighbors, who again, Morgan Park is a brand new subdivision. So we very much thank you for that subdivision that we are now the proud residents of Holly Springs and we're thrilled to be here. One thing that we have faced since we've moved in is where, if I can use the mouse again, if you see over here where the subdivision goes, over here approximately is a water treatment plant. 
While I'm not going to read to you the exact language in the Housing Association guidelines for this new subdivision, I do want to make a comment that the one thing that was clear, the only negative, if I can say, uh, outside of some traffic, which, you know, it is what it is with growth, right, um, is going to be there was a little bit of a foul odor coming out of that water treatment plant. That was, uh, I never got that those couple times I went by that house, but I was very fortunate once I signed the papers that it kind of hit me in the face a few different times. But I will say, I know that you've heard about this, um, this in the past, this is not new information. I just want to say you've been so kind to work with some options now to try to improve that smell for those of us that live in Morgan Park and the surrounding areas. But again, I do want to highlight that for, you know, if you are going to go through with this long term, think about those residents and these property owners that you're bringing because, again, the whole point of your town and why this makes it so wonderful is your residents. We are the backbone of your town clear cut. So first comment I want to bring up is about the water treatment plant. Second one is uh, construction. So again, I pointed out, we live in a brand new subdivision. We are actually still going through phases of our own. To this day, we have some construction uh, trucks, vehicles, whatever you want to call it, uh, such, going through our current neighborhood. And while we understand that may happen, I do hope we can talk about, if you're going to come from a certain way here with this division, where are you entering? Where are you exiting? You know, Berman Edge, for example, is a private road, is my understanding. So you would be entering through Morgan Park to reach this area, if that's the case, which entrance which exit, et cetera, can we give some, some thought and counsel to that where there's a neighborhood there of many more homes than I even know the number and a lot of small children. So this is just a consideration for you. The third one is my ask, and I'm going to leave you with the ask so it sticks with you. That's the buffer. I will tell you I am five foot seven in heels. I'm five foot nine. I'm telling you that for a reason. Someone is requesting a five foot buffer from my house here on this side to the new subdivision. Someone is requesting a 20-foot buffer. See how there's more land here? 20-foot buffer from over there. Look at my height. Five feet's about here. That's not a whole bunch of land, OK? All I'm asking is, if we're looking on 20 feet on one side and five on another, that seems to be a little inequitable last time I checked. Uh, the folks that are selling this property happen to live on Berman Edge. I'll leave it at that. My point to all of you is, can we look for some distribution here to say that if we are one subdivision, we are happy to have neighbors on the other side of us? What can we do to make things equitable, understanding that you're not looking to maximize a 20-foot buffer on both sides? That takes away from your land, takes away from your, from your money. Understood. What can we do, though, to try to make things good for the folks of Morgan Park who have just moved into Holly Springs? And that's where I'll leave you. Got it. Thank All you, right. Chrissy. Thank, Thank you so much. Oh, and I'm, I'm not here for the uh, alcohol annex or the alcohol thing earlier, but that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> There's my feedback. All right. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. All good Thank points. You, Thank you. At this point in time, no one else has signed up for the, uh, the public hearing. So at this point in time, we'll close it. Any further discussion or questions? We have Gina. Seeing none, we have one motion. Make the motion to adopt annexation ordinance A1701 annexing 15.985 acres more or less owned by Don S. and Miranda W. Sutton into the corporate limits of the town of Holly Springs. Second. Motion been made and second all in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Agenda item 7B, public hearing 17 SEU 02 slice 17 DP 04, Thames Academy, Matt Beard. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, guys. Hang on just a second, Matt. Okay, go for it. And again, this is sworn testimony, so go ahead, Matt. All right, good evening. good evening. The next item in front of you is for uh, Thales Academy uh, School, located on Holly Springs New Hill Road. Um, is located just past the intersection um, with Old Holly Springs Apex Road. Uh, this is the um, Hensley subdivision with the, um, there's a proposed um, extension to the Hensley subdivision um, at the adjacent property. Um, we can kind of discuss that as part of the site plan review. Um, the uh, property is zoned R10, so they would be required to get a special exception use um, in order to establish a school um, on that residential property. So the future land use plan shows uh, the property as uh, residential just outside of a reg regional center. 
and the residential designation does support uh, limited um, commercial and institutional uses um, just as the uh, residential zoning does. Um, so here we see the zoning map, uh, the property is R10. Uh, the site plan complies with uh, all of our requirements uh, with the exception of a uh, pedestrian connection from front door to um, the frontage along Holly Springs New Hill Road uh, for which they have requested a waiver. Uh, the applicant could speak to that in a minute. Um, <coughs> landscaping has been provided to meet all of our requirements. An alternate landscaping request has been made uh, to essentially move their north buffer from the north property line. This is all wooded up here uh, to basically just bring their buffer down to the edge of the woods and retain all the woods that are up there. Um, property is adjacent to residential below this line. So there's a heavier buffer over here than you would see in the north, north side of that line uh, where it's industrial zoning. Um, and then to the west is the Hensley subdivision I was talking about. This would be a connection made to that subdivision where they've shown on their site plans. Um, the street trees chosen for this uh, dedicated public uh, roadway would be um, matching those in the Hensley subdivision. So you'd have that kind of continuity through there with the plant selection. So you see the school in the center of the site. This is their um, turf play area just to the north. Uh, the elevations uh, meet all of our architecture and design requirements um, the, with the exception of the height exceeding our 35 foot maximum, exceeding it by four inches. And they've uh, requested a variance uh, for that um, to change the requirements to 35 feet and five inches. I guess give themselves a little wiggle room. And that is seen at this point, so. If you'd like to hear from Elizabeth. Absolutely. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Hi, meetings would not be complete without her. That's quite correct, Reverend Jim. <laughs> Glad to share a little bit of the update on what is going on with the engineering side of the requirements. Um, for this site, we do have an existing water line along New Hill Road, and so this site's just tying into the existing 12-inch line. The sewer for this site will require an extension through the Hensley subdivision and extending on through to this site. So there is a portion that is not constructed at this time, but is expected that if Hensley continues, that that will be available to this project at their property line. Um, a traffic study was completed for this project and on-site requirements were incorporated into their plans. There are a couple of off-site improvements that came out of that study. One was the um, Green Oaks Parkway and New Hill Road intersection. That signal at that intersection, there is an impact from this site on that signal. The way we've handled it for a few other projects and that we will handle it for this one as well is to collect a fee proportionate to the um, impact that this project has on that intersection. And at the time that the signal is warranted, that, that money would be available to put the signal in. In addition to that, this project has committed to doing the signal warrant analysis to see if we're at that threshold now. If it is not met before the school opens, they will run that same analysis after the school opens. So there's a couple of different commitments to that to try and address the need for um, families to be able to get to and from the schools that are along this road. Um, in addition to that, there are road improvements along the frontage as we typically see. Um, this is four lane median divided. Um, this is a project that is showing the half of the median extended as we've been seeing along New Hill Road. The um, project is connecting to Hensley 
through a street stub here, and this will be a public street with a break in the access, a break in the median, so a lefts will be allowed in and out through this access point. There is a, um, I skipped over one item, there is a current town pump station, a very small old pump station, one of the original pump stations the town had, um, the New Hill Road pump station, that is anticipated will be impacted by the road improvements for this project, and the developer is um, working with the town to um, enter into maybe a developer agreement, an infrastructure reimbursement agreement, in order to facilitate that pump station coming offline um, and being able to, it, it will be able to be served gravity through this site so we can begin to make steps towards removing that pump station. So that will likely come back to you in a later meeting. Then from the environmental side, it's pretty straightforward. This is in the um, Cape Fear River Basin and is subject to our town's NPDES phase two post-construction stormwater ordinance. And that would be the stormwater device that you see on the plan. Any questions? questions Elizabeth, at this point? I'm sorry, that was the second improvement that was require, off-site requirement. Um, the signal was one, and um, there is an additional um, through lane on the bypass that is needed. Um, this project has a small percentage of the impact of that lane, but it is an improvement that will be needed to extend a third lane northbound um, right around the New Hill Road um, 55 intersection. So it's pretty much from U-turn to U-turn is about the limits of it. Um, they are going to be paying a fee proportionate to their impact that will be able to be available when that improvement can be constructed in the future. Okay. And I know that there are traffic engineers here if there's more detailed questions on the specifics of those items. Elizabeth, is it just one way in and one way out into, into the project? Is that what I'm seeing? So the, it's one street in, but it will connect through the Hensley subdivision would be a secondary way, but yes, this is one way in, one way out. Okay. But the most of the traffic will probably be coming off of New Hill Road into the subdivision That's and into the, to the school, cool. circulating around and then, then heading back out mm -hmm. onto the road versus into the adjacent. Correct. Does the, so the median that is um, to the left of the school, in front of the school, how does it impact entrance and egress into Hensley? to a certain degree and? This does not, Hensley is on this side of the project. Um, Hensley will be extending their road improvements mm -hmm. um, and there will need to be a left turn lane constructed here to be able to accommodate this new driveway. So with, with the Hensley improvements or the expansion of Hensley, their additional entrance into the subdivision will be in, in front of that median so that Correct. residents it, would typically have to go out. Hensley to, does have a full access point further down. Right. Um, the one closest to this side will be right in, right out, and then this would be a full access and would be available to the residents of Hensley if they so chose. Now, how far is it? I kind of recall that roughly. 1,200 feet, give or take. 1,200 feet is the spacing between the brakes. I don't remember exactly how far the spacing is between the other right in, right out. Um, okay. and do we have any rule or regulation in terms of how many? entrance points to subdivisions or schools or whatnot and in, in spacing? We do have requirements about how many entrances are needed for residential subdivisions. Um, it's based off a threshold of number of lots. Um, for a school, um, it's not uncommon to have one entrance That's with right. a loop around the school. Is there minimum spacing between entrances to adjacent parcels like so Hensley will have two entrances, I think, and, and the additional one in front of Thales. I'm just curious what mm -hmm. the what the uh, there would be allowed are. to be another. I assume you're asking this direction back towards the intersection with Old Holly Springs Apex Road, or is that just in or general just in either direction? General flow of traffic. Mm -hmm. If we're having a lot of exit points and possible entrance points. Uh, so anything um, that's within that 1,200 feet of that access point that's the full would be right in, right out. There is a spacing that you like to see. Um, it's several hundred feet away from um, a driveway that another intersection would be. Um, there's a difference between streets and driveways, the spacing that's needed. Um, this is a street. Um, driveways for individual projects. We try and um, re, um, encourage shared drives and um, interconnectivity when we can to minimize how many of those curb cuts there are. 
will the school be responsible for the lighting across the that street there the main street there they are responsible for their road improvements along their entire frontage which includes the two lanes on the north side plus a turn lane um, to turn into their site the curb and gutter sidewalk um, and right-of-way dedication now, what I'm talking about is uh, the road going in this road yes they are responsible for that road okay. as well would this impact the speed limit in that area either during school hours or otherwise I don't know if a private school would affect school zone type hours um, I know that we have that uh, um, for Oakview um, further down the applicant may be able to speak to that I'm not familiar myself with that That's we can track question. it down. I, I think it does but I, I don't want to speak for that do you know Kendra? <laughs> the ones I've seen have but, for charter I don't know the full yeah I know yeah okay applicant, all right you want to bring the applicant up at this point or is there some more yeah. questions for Elizabeth I had one more thing that not sure for Elizabeth yeah. if I wanted to get to some planning board discussions oh yeah we will so do that yeah mm -hmm. Uh, so the only other thing that I failed to mention before was the waiver request for second story glazing. Um, the requirement is to provide 15% um, on their plans. They've provided 14.7. Um, they have exceeded the requirement on the lower level, um, and that is what that waiver is about, is for the second floor. What about the planning board? Uh, it looked like they had quite extensive discussions as it related to um, some concerns. The pedestrian, the pedestrian access. access. Yes. Yeah. In, in lightness, what do you mean? What were their discussions centered on? Were they concerned that they that needed to be that that the lack the lack of it was a problem? Yeah. I mean, we we would request that. Well, the ordinance requests that the a safe you know passage sidewalk be connected from the front door of the building mm -hmm. to each street frontage mm -hmm. the pathway shown on their plans takes you out up over down and then over to here if you are walking from this side and wanted to access the building those people are just gonna cut across yeah I mean be real mm -hmm. There, there was discussion, Matt, I think, about having a, a shortcut a bit uh, mm -hmm. on the, just as you're around that curve to head up. Was, did mm -hmm. anything come of that? Uh, no, I mean, it was never included in um, any motion for them to make changes. They did not volunteer to make yeah. changes. Um. So after discussion, the planning board voted 801, 801 on both issues. Am I correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Just curious. Anything else from Matt? Point. Yeah. Bring the applicant up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, please. Would the applicant come up, please? Introduce yourself, and we got some questions for you. You also were handed out, I think, a brochure. Am I correct? I yes, sir. Um, Mr. Mayor and, and Council Members, my name is Beth Trejos. I'm an attorney with Smithmore Leatherwood, and I'm here tonight on behalf of Thales Academy to request your support for the Thales project here in Holly Springs. Um, what I handed out to you um, is a component piece of our appraiser's uh, presentation. It is a report um, showing no negative impact on adjacent property values from the construction of a school at this location. Um, and we would ask that you include that in your record along with the staff report and other materials that have been provided to you. Um, recognizing that you have already have had and continue to have a long agenda we're going to try to make um, a uh, succinct presentation to you on the 20 some findings of fact that are associated with the special exception permit the waivers and the variance application um, at any time if you have questions please interrupt um, you know as we have our experts up here we would we would like to answer any questions you have um, I want, I want to thank your staff for the wonderful work that they have done. They have seen a lot of me over the past few weeks and the rest of our team, um, and we appreciate um, their willingness to work with us and to make a thorough presentation um, uh, covering many of the issues that we would have other, otherwise spoken to. Um, so just to make sure the request is clear, we are requesting the special exception permit 
we're requesting an architectural waiver for just 0.3%, which is really the difference between 45, 455 square feet of window and 466 square feet of window, 11 feet um, difference for the architectural waiver. Um, we are requesting a pedestrian access waiver. Um, we think um, in our, um, our landscape architect and engineers will speak to you about this, but there is a significant grade change from the sun front of the site um, to the school. It falls 17 feet. And so if we're to build a sidewalk that meets the ADA requirements, it would be a, a switchback sidewalk that would go across the front of the property. Every kid with a bike and a skateboard is going to ride down that thing. <laughs> it is going to be an attractive nuisance uh, and a safety risk for the school. Um, in our discussions with the planning board, we looked at opportunities for alternate locations. Um, there is an existing um, or there is a planned sidewalk here with a connection to the sidewalk that runs on both sides of the public street that we're building. Um, the grade continues to be an issue. Also, the significant landscaping that's required under your code would provide uh, an issue. Essentially, we'd have to build steps at that location. So ultimately, what the planning board recommended um, is that the, this access is sufficient. Um, and we hope that you will will support that and our engineers will speak to you in more detail about the actual design. Um, we are also requesting a variance for the height. Again, the grade change is significant um, such that the building will appear much shorter from the street than it is. Um, in addition, uh, they are using a building, a Thales building that they have used in other locations that fits their needs very well um, that we believe uh, and hope that you will find is attractive. Um, it includes a parapet wall that is something that is encouraged in your architectural and site design requirements and it just exceeds your height requirement by four inches. Um, and so we would uh, ask for your support. I know the, the planning board discussed it. I know they don't officially weigh in, but unofficially there were some very positive comments made about the design and we hope that you will support that. Um, so, given the questions that you asked, I, I first would like to call um, Mr. Travis, Travis Fluitt, who is our um, uh, traffic engineer uh, with Kimley Horn, and have him speak to you very briefly about the work that he did in support of this project. And again, please repeat your name and address, please, Travis. Travis Fluitt with Kimley Horn and Associates, 421 Fayetteville Street in Raleigh. Um, I am a registered professional engineer in the state of North Carolina with over 13 years of experience and I performed the traffic impact analysis for this site. Um, Elizabeth covered most of this, so I'll be very brief. Uh, our study went from, including New Hill Road going from Green Oaks Parkway over to the bypass and the U-turns on either side of New Hill Road, Holly Springs Road. The TIA was scoped through the town and DOT. Assumptions and analysis were reviewed and approved by town staff and NCDOT. And as Elizabeth said, the committed improvements for this development, and in addition to the thoroughfare widening on New Hill Road, we have the left and right turn lanes on New Hill Road into the new public street beside access, as well as our uh, commitment to perform signal warrant analyses at the intersection of New Hill Road and Green Oaks Parkway and then to provide a payment in lieu for our proportionate share for the cost of that signal, as well as the payment in lieu for the proportionate share of the <coughs> additional northbound through lane on the NC-55 bypass. It's approximately 3,500 linear feet of widening on the bypass. Um, and, and just briefly, is it your professional opinion that um, given the proposed improvements in the site design that uh, the site is safe in that it um, that it is sufficient in size and properly located to ensure automated, automotive and pedestrian safety? Yes, it is. Thank you. Any questions at this point? No. Not yet. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, I, I, before you leave, just one little point of cross-examination, if you would, and I, I hate to do it, um, because nothing's adversarial here, but it, the opinion that you just stated is pref prefaced on the payment in lieu and everything that you've discussed. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, you Councilor. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, and I'll call Mr. Christopher Miller. Uh, Mr. Miller is the landscape architect who has been uh, the lead designer on this project, and he is he works for Stewart. Again, name and address, please. Yes, sir. Hello. My name is Christopher Miller. I'm a landscape architect uh, with Stewart, uh, 421 Fayetteville Street, Raleigh, North Carolina. And as Beth mentioned, I've um, kind of led the overall site design. Uh, we're looking at about 11 acres here. Thales Academy is uh, fronting on New Hill uh, Road, but also we're building a new public street, a new town street coming in. So our actual driveway is on your new uh, town street. From New Hill Road, it's actually 17 feet down to try to balance the site as this um, grade change comes all the way down to the back um, where the, the old uh, dump was um, back there. We are providing the connection into to Hensley um, subdivision and um, generally the building is set back generously from all property lines and including like we had mentioned in the beginning, a uh, significant tree stand um, to the north. The pedestrian access is um, provided um, down the new, uh, the new street um, and around uh, to the front door. I guess I could point with this, excuse me. Um, so, so the new street has sidewalks on both sides. Uh, with connections into the Hensley subdivision, including a um, crosswalk here and a crosswalk here, down and across to the front door. So again, to reiterate what Beth said regarding the attractive nuisance, uh, providing a sidewalk connection from New Hill Road down, we think that there's a, an attractive nuisance about providing that switchback right to the front door and just the uh, ongoing security with the students and the long-term um, maintenance of that and the uh, upkeep with the uh, landscape in that position. There's another opportunity to put another um, uh, pedestrian access over here on the side, um, as Beth pointed out, that's a, a, again on a, on a slope that would require some stairs. So uh, we could provide that as a more direct access, um, not directly from New Hill, but again, it would be from the side, but a, uh, accessible um, access would be down and around um, to the front door that way. Okay. And there's no opportunity on the this side of the property, the uh, uh, the shopping center, the opposite side, right where you've got your air. That there's the great, there's the grates terrible there also. It's so. this, it's a, it gets better, but it's uh, still a similar situation with a three to one slope down uh, to the site. Okay, what, what will the this slope consist of? Like the re the reason I ask is, um, I this kind of reminds me of Holly Glen. Uh, Holly Grove Elementary School, where the uh, entrance is over on the side. Again, you the sidewalk snakes around, but um, kids are constantly that walk to school run down that hill um, right to the grass. So I didn't know if that's going to be a safety problem for are people going to be able to cut through, and what will happen when they do? Yeah, I think um, our intent is to have it uh, fully landscaped, and that. Um, the other, the other point to, uh, to make about people walking to school is the Henley subdivision is immediately um, to the west. Mm -hmm. And the, you know their connection, if you look at where they're coming in, most of the people that live there will walk through the neighborhood streets and would actually come in right. from this new location. The mm -hmm. Holly Springs New Hill Road connects to Target in the commercial center and down out um, along the four lane median divided. So, and also being a pre-K through fifth grade, I mean, that's 10 years old, max age. So typically accompanied by an adult. I know when I bring my kid to school, she doesn't walk there by herself. Um, so again, we just think that most people, if they are walking to school are coming from the back, but typically they're um, you know, accompanied by an adult in this type of school. Any other questions, Mr. Architect? Thanks, sir. Yeah. Um, I'll call Mr. Rich Kirkland. Um, Mr. Kirkland provided the report that you have, and he is an MAI certified real estate appraiser. Good evening. Mm -hmm. um, Good evening. Name and address, please. Uh, Rich Kirkland, 9408 Northfield Court, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, again, I was just um, asked to look at this site, the proposed daily site, to see if it would have any impact on adjoining property values. I've done impact studies for a, a variety of uses. Um, I've looked at school sites before. I actually regularly appraise sites for the Wake County Public School System. Um, and um, research, I believe you've got the package up there. It shows that there's no impact uh, that I can find on adjoining property values associated with a private school. I can further say that looking at public schools, I've also not seen such issues. 
Um, again, it actually tends to have the reverse. Whenever I praise the site for the Wake County Public School System, you go out later and look, see where they're building it. There's subdivisions that are being built all around it at the same time. So um, it's in my professional opinion, this will have no impact on the adjoining property values. Questions? Yeah. No. You're good. Thanks, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, I'll call Mr. Joe Armstead, who is the um, architect and building <laughs> to speak with you. And I think he has some pictures of existing Thales uh, buildings so you can really see the differentiation in the brick. Okay. And I will, I'll be Vanna for. <laughs> <laughs> and again, name and address, please, Joe. <clears throat> Joe Armstead. Uh, 3206 Heritage Trade Drive, Suite 112, Wake Forest. Thank you. Uh, As I said, uh, good evening. I'm Joe Armstead with Baxter Armstead Architecture. Uh, 24 years experience in the architectural profession and I've been a registered architect in the state of North Carolina since 2002. Um, my office has worked with uh, Thales for approximately uh, 10 years working on uh, and establishing their uh, K-5 facility that uh, we have here tonight. Um, we, we believe in that time frame that it, it's, it's, excuse me, let me back up, it's built uh, in several locations around the triangle. And in that time frame, we believe that we've established uh, a visually appealing facility that not only meets the school's needs, but uh, fits with the local communities. And uh, do you want to? Would it be right if we just, yeah, set them okay, up out here. <laughs> okay. Now where's the other locations again? Nightdale is one, right? That's the one I remember. Okay. I've been to that one. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Um, and again, uh, it's nothing better than a, uh, uh, a full-scale uh, 3D version as opposed to looking at the uh, two-dimensional elevations. Um, so if I could get you to comment briefly on, um, um, can you just talk about the, the building design and the, the bit that exceeds the 35 foot maximum height requirement? Uh, yes. Um, we obviously uh, vary the height of the parapets, one, to meet the ordinances um, uh, for not having one continuous uh, wall plane, one continuous roof line. Um, but it also is uh, helps to uh, screen the uh, rooftop mechanical units. Um, and can you talk about how the building will appear from the street given the grade change? Uh, well, obviously, it will appear much shorter if you're, uh, I believe our uh, finished floor, from finished floor to second finished floor is uh, 16 feet. So that's approximately just, just shy of the height of uh, the street frontage. So you'll be driving by at the second floor level. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the facility all of the requirements, all the necessary services and equipment, restrooms, cooking facilities, safety equipment, et cetera, are included within the design? Uh, of course. As, as said before, um, we have it in multiple locations. Uh, the school knows, um, you know, their operational requirements. Uh, they, they are up and operating, like I said, over the last uh, eight to 10 years. Um, I, I will point out that there is no cafeteria uh, in this facility. There's no lunch room. Um, the the meals are catered in, and children or students eat uh, in their classrooms. Is that right? Okay. Is Any, that unusual? I, I've never heard of that yeah. before, but I can believe it. Mm -hmm. um, my kids go to a charter school, and that's that's, that's how they, they do. Are. Yeah, some private yeah. schools do it. Okay. Yeah. Like everyday silent lunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, you, if you've ever sure. been a lunch parent, it's not silent. <laughs> <laughs> at least not at my kid's school. Not in the younger grades. Are you guys putting in a basketball court by any chance inside? Uh, basketball court, no. Yeah. Okay. But Anything else? Not in the building. They, they may have uh, a hoop on the uh, playground. Outside. Yeah. Okay. What would be the capacity of the, of the school? 450 students. How many employees? I would have to ask the client how many 
We're well, going to have a representative from Thales come up next, but uh, mm -hmm. my belief is 30 staff members. Mm -hmm. okay. and, um, what the building is um, just over 31,000 square right. feet. So. Just shy of 16,000 uh, per floor. Okay. Two stories. Two stories, obviously. I think we got that one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, one final witness for you. Um, if, if there are no other questions. For Any other questions? That, well, I had one. You said the number of students were 450. Uh, grades incorporated in that would be from what to what? Kindergarten to fifth. K to five. K to five. I missed that. Okay. K to five. Thank you. I'm, any more? I'm good. Yep. Yeah. Right. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you. One final witness, Dr. Hall, who is. Um, the head of school for Thales, just to give you some information on the flavor of the Thales Academy. Dr. Timothy Hall, uh, 6520 Willow Lawn Drive, Wake Forest, North Carolina. I'm the Director of Operations and Academics at Thales Academy. Some of you might want to know what Thales is about. Um, we're about high quality, affordable cost education. Private education, not for profit. and. Um, we're a chain school. We have six schools across the, the, the triad area. So, um, and one thing to, to note, I mean, before you, uh, we, we're a classical school. And most people associate classical school with old and stuffy, but if you look at our growth in the past two years, you'll see that we're not. We've had two schools in the past few years and a thousand students across our six campuses. So we're having explosive growth. People like what they have at Thales Academy. So uh, just to give you some uh, components of our uh, curriculum, first off, we, we have direct instruction, pre-K through the fifth grade. We have Socratic uh, dialogues, grades six through 12. We also have a high emphasis on technology, uh, iPads in our high schools, uh, digital citizenship, uh, K-12 uh, standards. Uh, in addition, we have a, a special program, a pre-engineering elective called LIT, Light Institute of Technology, which is a STEM program that we have in, in our school as well. So uh, we do have a, a, a STEM focus, also a classical focus as well. What makes us classical in general is uh, there, there are several key components, but one is the Latin. They take Latin starting in the sixth grade all the way through the 12th grade. Good stuff. It is good stuff. It's yes. good stuff. It, it teaches them a lot about logic. It also teaches them about the font of Western civilization, which is uh, the Romans right. and the Romance languages. Mm -hmm. In addition, they take a, a series of scope and sequence of trivium. Trivium allows them to learn how to learn informal logic and formal logic and then go up to rhetoric and be able to put that all together to develop strong arguments. Finally, we talk about Western tradition. We're talking about the Greeks and the Romans in starting in the sixth grade and move all the way through up to American tradition through the 12th grade. We couple that with our literature and history classes. So they get a good understanding of where they are in the Western culture. Timothy, the ones I visited had a playground on the edge or the outside. Does this have a playground? Which one? At Raleigh, I think you said it's you saw Raleigh, it. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Does Very. this have the same kind of a situation or not? I think they had set up in uh, Just curious. Yeah. I don't know. Had a track yes. right here. Yes, yes sir. Right there. Oh, I see. Is that the track? Or? Oh, I see. It's the playground. track behind the ground. Oh, I see it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, is there, uh, do you have any plans to expand to 6 to 12 in this location? No, not at this time. And how many, uh, and what did you say the class size? So how many per grade do you think, K through 5? K through five, 400 to 450. What, uh, what hours of operation and will it open at full capacity? Will not open at full capacity. Typically we start about maybe 100 students and we start maybe pre-K, well kindergarten through the second grade is normally where you kind of are able to enroll people and then you move up and, and progress grade by grade upwards. Most people don't want to take a chance coming to a new school in the fifth or fourth grade. It's just hard to, to gain enrollment in those grades. Makes sense. What, uh, what start time and, and end time? Start time is about 7.15, ends about 2.50. Give or take, yeah. Yes, yeah, <clears throat> And, and uh, no buses, just all? No buses, carpool. Okay. Dr. Paul, we had a question about the number of staff. I said 30, was that right? Correct. 30, 30, 30 staff. And, and just looking at the economic impact, think about this. I mean, you have 30 staff. They had to make about an average of $45,000 a piece to bring into your community. In addition, if you read the, the re, uh, a study by uh, Dr. Bart Danielson of NC State, 
he talks about how schools, good schools like Thales, which we are a good school, uh, bring economic action because what happens is families move towards the school. So they'll move towards Thales. And so um, with right now not thinking about um, expanding, where would these students end up usually going to middle school? So uh, we have a junior high high school in Apex, which is uh, 12 minutes away. So, so they're ready for that. Okay. Yeah, so that's part of the, the process. We usually like to have two feeder schools into our junior high, high school, junior high high schools. So and we have two of those, one in Rollsville and one in Apex. Okay, and the retention, or, or for the children that do go on to stay at Thales Middle School, mm -hmm. what percent is that? And the reason I'm asking this is, uh, you know, the shortage of schools that Wake County has, uh, they don't seem to be building too many middle schools. Uh, so that would be my concern of where these, how many of these kids will go on to your Thales location. Retention is very high. I'll tell you about Rollsville uh, School. We have um, uh, 150 sixth graders that came in. More than what, um, that's actually more than what's coming in from our Raleigh campus and our Wake Forest campus. So we have people who are coming to Thales. They're, they very much believe in the brand that we're providing. This might be a question more for the traffic engineer, but if you're committed to do a signal analysis when the school is open, but you're opening at not full capacity, that seems to skew the results? That, that would be a question for yeah. someone else. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> you don't have to reintroduce yourself as someone else either. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think we just need to work with staff to find a threshold at which the occupancy is high enough. You know, if it takes them four or five years, we may not want to wait that long, but find an appropriate threshold to do the warrant analysis if it doesn't, if it's not met before sure, the school sure. opens. And we have looked at it. I'm, I'm hopeful, but I think it probably will warrant it. Good. It was already sort of questionable like a year or two ago when we looked at it. So yeah. with Oakview opening up and then with Trinity, once people start moving in there, I feel like that it'll be warranted. Be a lot more traffic volume. Yeah. Uh, are you? Do you know what the answer is to the speed limit? Will that be a school zone? Is there a school zone? Zone private? I do not. Okay, I just one. I'm sure, we'll find out. Do you remember about the other schools? I don't remember either. I, I would say, uh, <laughs> Mr. Roach. Um, this is Michael Roach, who is also sworn in with families. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. <laughs> good transition. Question about speed limits. And again, name and address, please. Hello, uh, Michael Roach with Thales Academy, 4641 Paragon Park Road, Raleigh. Um, this, I, I'm the director of development for Thales, so I go out and, and go through this process uh, for each location. We've actually ran across that in our uh, location that we're um, working on near Charlotte, Waxhaw, North Carolina. And that is, um, something that DOT has the authority to put in a speed limit if they want or, or not. And generally how it was explained to us, at least for Waxhaw, is um, they are not going to start out with a lower speed limit. If there is issues, they'll visit that and they'll, uh, they can put in a, a school speed limit. Um, Do you remember who you work with at DOT? Uh, that is uh, the one down there in Charlotte was uh, I mean, up here, have you ever worked with them? Oh, up here, um, in the past, we've worked with uh, Reed uh, Elmore. Okay, we know. Um, and then, um, yeah. We're going to have the uh, secretary down very soon. So oh, maybe great. we can ask that question. <clears throat> Straight to the top. I like it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, uh, do your, uh, the reason we ask is we're talking about, um, you know, we have a school zone, then will we not have a school zone, then we have a school zone, you know, is it going to be consistent, as you said, across the board? So that's the reason we're just trying to f figure that out. And, and DOT's dealt with this in the past. They they generally come up with a, a, a good plan, and um, it it's not necessarily have to be straight by the book. They'll look at the site and see what makes sense. Mm, okay. at, at least that's the experience I've had with them. May I make one comment? Um, you mentioned about the, the students going to the Apex uh, Middle School. Currently, we have over 120 Holly Springs um, residents 
that go to our apex school. So uh, our, from uh, kindergarten through uh, 12th grade. So I mean, I, I do not see a, a issue um, of them being stranded. Right, right. Uh, although we, we are open to uh, looking at the possibility of, of doing a junior high around this area if it warrants it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Beth? Um, no, sir, Mr. Mayor. I'm um, just with that um, expert testimony, we would submit that we have met all of the required findings and ask please for your support um, of the four items that are before you tonight. Thank Sound you. Sound like an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. What? Yeah. Anything else, Matt? Matt. Before we go to the uh, public hearing? I had nothing else to add. No. Okay. All right. We have uh, several people that have signed up. A couple of them, I suspect, might be with this same company. So I, I'll ask Adam Pike for starters. Adam Pike? Uh, with you, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can. Any questions for him? We bring him up. Think we're good? We're good. You're off the hook, Adam. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Is there anybody else here on this? He's from Youngsville. Okay. <laughs> is that the is that the troops? Yeah. Okay. All right. Then we're good. Okay. Thank you again. Appreciate it. All right, let's go to, uh, da, 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 da. oh, that's gone, that's gone. How about Dan Poland, am I correct? Anything to add to that, Dan Poland? Land. Okay. All right, thank you. You got a big group. We didn't want you to have any questions. <laughs> And you covered that one, so we're good. I guess we're all good then with the public hearings. At this point in time, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, for discussion, board? Well, I don't have issue with the uh, the, the height waiver. I know the, the extra couple of inches. Don't have any issue with the uh, the glazing. Right. Way we're looking at. I uh, do have an issue with the um, with the access from the from the sidewalk. I would like to see um, even if. They have to put in the stairs. I'd like to see uh, access from the sidewalk to the uh, the front of the building. I agree. Stair, stair access. Yeah. Stair access. Uh, straight up. Stair access. Straight up front, or even off to the side. I mean, even even off, off to the side's okay, but yeah, a little bit more so they're not having to yeah. leave their way. Yeah, I think uh, even to the east of. Thales, there'll be there could be apartments and and, and even and, more mm -hmm. uh, pedestrian access. We got any reaction on that? We don't normally do it this way, but we might as well. Steps. Uh, you 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 need to find as a fact that they haven't met the okay. findings of fact uh, with respect to the access. Um, you know, and and given that the public hearing, you did close the public hearing. You know, that's true. You, you I can only sort of, you know, you you could just reopen the public hearing. Well, you, you could uh, if you think there's going to be more facts, um, you know. But if if you've heard all the facts and it's your opinion that they haven't met their burden to prove that um, the, they're not entitled to the waiver or the access issue. I'm only one person. It wouldn't change my mind. It would or would not? Would not. If they got a second chance. Mm -hmm. But I'm only one. Mm -hmm. Clarify. I'm only one person. Yeah, clarify because I'm, yeah, I'm confused. I mean, is, what changed if, they, if they were to come back up there and submit more evidence. Okay. Finding the fact that, okay. It would not change my mind. Okay. I'm certain it would not change saying. my mind. Okay. I want, I'd like to see a side, okay. I mean, uh, access from the sidewalk to saying. the front of the building. Is there a way to resolve this? Well, I, I think you just 
you, you rule on all the other waivers and so, then you take a vote you know, um I, you know i'd suggest you go through so motion you could you could motion you could two motion looks like that. it's the one for the waiver of the architectural designs and, and waiver of pedestrian circulation and vehicular area design requirements that's the one that deals with the sidewalk correct that's correct well yeah that, okay so one variance of development standards three and special exception use and development plan four those would be not impacted by us having concerns about number two one would be am i reading that correctly motion one would be the one yes motion one is right. has all the findings of fact okay. has all the findings of fact okay sorry so you would change that you change one you change one two to two, the sidewalk three and four are not a problem one is the findings of fact right. for all of them for all of them right yeah so you would change that you would deny that or, or strike out the one or the waiver of the strike it out trans circulation of vehicular area design requirements you'd strike that from number one you rule on the others I mean, if you if you if you make the findings of fact in motion number one, then you know the the rest are sort of perfunctory um, because you you know you you've, you've stated that they've made their burden. Found, you found all the facts, and then you just go forward. So motion number one, you would strike the part that says and the waiver of pedestrian circulation and vehicle area design seven WAV ten. You take Correct. that part out of motion number right. one. If that's the, if that, I, I think this what, board has to heading. vote. That's right. where we're heading. That's right. I okay. think the board has to vote on on the waiver of the pedestrian. That seems to be the only thing. So you, I think you need to just take a vote on that. <coughs> what kind of motion would you need, Councilor? About that resolution striking that phrase. You, I think that five of you need to vote on whether or not they've met their burden or not with respect to the findings of fact for the waiver of the vehicular and pedestrian access issue. And that's let, me, let me go ahead and you just stop me where, where I need to stop. And that's more, in the, right? that's more in the discussion phase right now. We would internally vote, decide that, that that's where we want to be, and then move on to the motion phase. Is what, that what I'm, is that? What you have right now is, is one council member that says they have met their burden. Yeah, you got more than one. Yeah. All right, so I would, you know, I think you have pretty much a all the people all the people who feel that they have not met their burden for the vehicular access waiver requirement raise your hand okay all of them so then that's a unanimous vote and the record reflect that that would have been a unanimous vote so that you would then um move on suggested motion number one striking the findings of fact with respect to the pedestrian circulation of the vehicular area design requirements. Okay. And then motion two, would that be, would there be, we would, well, sure, let's, let's do that one first and we'll tweet the cycle. Got it. Is it legit to bring the counselor back? She has a point to make. You want to reopen the public I'll hearing? I'll reopen the public hearing. <laughs> yeah. Yes, counselor. Counselor, is that the the sidewalk they talked about in the be that he mentioned in the yeah. beginning? Um, 
We're talking about a sidewalk along coming off the main highway, the yeah. main road, um, off well, New Hill. Um, can yeah, can we go, go back, back to the, yeah, yep. I, I'd like to see that. <clears throat> so, um, there you are. So we're, we're building a sidewalk along the frontage right. and then, then the sidewalk here. What we had discussed with the planning board as perhaps an alternative would be here. to put, um, put a connection here that includes included stairs so it would be a more direct access. It, it, and I can bring the engineers forward, but the, the construction of a sidewalk here, given the grade, is going to be extremely difficult. It will take a large portion of the frontage going back and forth um, to make that connection. Um, if, if, if this would be an acceptable alternative with stairs, um, they could construct that. Um, and, and Mike, I don't know if you want to come forward and, and, and talk a little bit. We, uh, we did have quite a discussion with planning board regarding this. Um, we do have a, a major concern doing either uh, stairs straight down here or, or doing switchbacks back and forth. Uh, one, safety. Um, you get large stairs going down there and kindergartners walking down there. That's, that's a big deal. Um, as far as security goes, um, we're concerned with people riding skateboards, bikes, um, down these uh, areas, not going to the school, but going there for fun and, and, and excitement. Um, our, what we're unsure about is how much use this would be from the school, um, it, from the, uh, the surrounding, area. yeah, surrounding areas. Um, we don't see much access walking in. Yep. On either side. And there is another neighborhood up on the other side, uh, the Forest Springs neighbor neighborhoods up there. I don't know how many would walk from there, but that is a consideration. Just in terms of the required findings of fact for this particular waiver, um, the first is that the proposed pedestrian circulation and vehicle area design will result in a development pattern which is equivalent to or superior to that achievable under the applicable regulations. And we did submit to you in our written application that the access that we're providing is equivalent. It is, there is a safe path to walk um, uh, to the school, whichever direction you arrive from. And, I, my observation as a parent of an elementary school student is nobody walks to school anymore. <laughs> um, but it, it, there is sufficient uh, ability for them to do so. The second finding is that the proposed development will be compatible with and will enhance the use or value of area, area properties. And our appraiser uh, indicated to you that schools are commonly found in neighborhoods such as this. There's a significant amount of sidewalk connection being made particularly into the immediately adjacent single family subdivision which is the most likely supplier of students um, the third is that the proposed development is consistent with the intent of the comp plan um, planning staff has said that the school itself is consistent with the comprehensive plan we think the the access design complements that again it is um, it provides for easy pedestrian and vehicular access, perhaps not the most direct route, but the safest route. Um, and that the proposed development is consistent with the intent and purposes of the UDO. Um, the intent is, is to allow schools within the residential district. This is a compatible use. There's a school down the street. Um, you know, we think that the requirements of the waiver have been met with substantial competent material evidence um, and we would ask for your support of the waiver or an alternative condition to the special exception permit that would allow Thales to go forward um, so that they can start welcoming students from Holly Springs next year. I'll just say, I mean, my concern is I do, I, I, my kids have gone to Holly Grove Elementary School for, since it opened, um, and living right there, I see kids do walk to school quite a bit, parents, will tend to drop them off at the corner and then they run down that, that grade um, and jump on the sidewalk to go to the front of the school. This is a little bit different because it's surrounded by the carpool and will be surrounded by cars. So I, I'm, 
just asking, really keep in mind the safety, because people tend, to, especially fifth graders, parents will walk them right there, or I see the school, you go ahead and go down. You know, it happens, even though we say we wouldn't do it, it does happen, so that's, that's a big concern. Right, and I think that would be something that could be put in the handbook, that would be direction to parents that students are to be brought, um, either walked into the front door or to be driven. And that's something that we do have full control over. If, uh, if we see a, a parent dropping a kid off and they run down there, we're going to have a conversation with the uh, parent. And if they choose to continue to do that, then we'll, we may choose to ask them not to come back. So we do have full control over that. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything else? So did we decide about any, any other? So I'm just asking what's, you know, they've offered mm -hmm. the... See, I'm, for me, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not looking at the current condition. I'm, we just don't know what the future condition is, and I don't want to be in a position where someone says, why is there, why didn't you approve a, uh, or didn't, why did you require uh, access from, from the sidewalk? So I'm looking ahead. Okay. Anything else for the applicants? No, I mean, I, I got your point where, you know, from a safety perspective, when first graders and second graders, when they get out of school, if they see an access point where they can run up steps, um, you know, uh, from a safety standpoint, I, I understand why you're, you're looking at that. Um, but if we could uh, build steps to uh, the left of the building coming in, I, I'd like to see that as another access for people that are coming. Yes, right down there. Yeah. That's yeah. my take on that. I'm satisfied with that, that yeah. condition. Yeah, I, I just think at least one access would be good. I'm still concerned that the, it's all surrounded by the carpool lane. There's just no way that the kids will be able to avoid crossing that are walking. That, that's a big concern, but I think at least the one stairwell. We would be happy to accept that as a condition on the special exception permit. Okay. Anything else? All right, we'll close the public hearing again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you again. again. Well, safety first. That's right. We understand. And let's go to the motions. We read this motion. Yeah, how do you read that? I motion? think so we'll as have to add as a point of clarification, it it would be a condition on the development plan, not on the special exception use, because the special exception use is to mm -hmm. put a school on the property. Good point, yeah. Right. Um, you're you're going to add, in suggested motion number four, the development plan conditions, you're going to add a seven, paragraph seven. Mm -hmm. But before we get to four, we got to get to one. <laughs> and one's going to say um, that you're going to uh, make a motion to make the, fi the findings of fact that they've met the requirements forward um, subject to the um, completion of the development plan conditions outlined in suggested motion Got number it. four, which will now include number seven, the stairs. <laughs> so that's going to be at the end of after, as specified in exhibit A with the conditions that Joni is going to Right. When we get to four, you're going to you're going to make a motion to add a, a new paragraph with respect to the stairs. But there's no tweaking that needs to be done to motion number one. Number one, I, I think, needs to say that you um, you're making a motion to adopt uh, this resolution, making the findings of fact that are met subject to the completion of all the development plan conditions contained in next the uh, the development plan condition right that fast <laughs> joni's got it joni's got it right that fast joni's got it and the, Am I right, the remainder of that paragraph you got it verbatim in, in the resolution for that that is reference 1731 exhibit d talks about adding additional conditions to any of the waivers so you'll want to add as a condition in exhibit d to waiver 17 wav 10 the condition that they uh, amend the development plan and that's how we'll capture it in the, the actual resolution that you adopt i don't know how to even bring it up <laughs> they so moved yeah just say yeah change the as printed on the screen she didn't change our town clerk has it change the motion yet it's just subject to completion of 
Try that. Item number yeah, four. we can try it out. See if that works. Why don't want to do it? No. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we need a CPA for this. Okay, no. God. No, go ahead. Do you want to do it? Yeah. Not me. Hey, Tom, uh, 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 okay, Tom's going to handle it. Correct me. Tom's going to do it. Or advise me. <laughs> I told uh, you. Not. Motion to adopt resolution number 17 31, making and accepting the findings of fact to be recorded in the minutes for special exception U 17 SEU 02. Variance of a development standard 17 VARTC 03. Waiver of Architectural Design Requirements 17-WAV09 and Waiver of a Pedestrian Circulation and Vehicular, I'm sorry, Vehicular Area Design Requirements uh, 17-WAV-10 for Thales Academy to allow for a school in the R10 Residential District as submitted by Stewart Inc. as specified in Exhibit A. Subject to completion uh, ED 17, uh, section four. Correct? That's good. A motion been made, do I hear a second? Second. Motion been made, second all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. One nay. Okay, number two. A motion to approve waivers of UDO section 3.08 alternate compliance with architectural and site design requirements 17-WAV-09 and waiver of regulations of UDO section 7.09 waiver of pedestrian circulation and vehicular area design requirements in association with development petition number 17-DP-04 for Thales Academy as submitted by Stuart Inc. Second. Second. Made second all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. One nay. Number three. Motion to approve variance petition 17 VARTC03, a variance for from the Unified Development Ordinance Section 2.04 B7 R10 Residential District maximum building height to allow an increase in building height from 35 feet to 35 feet and 5 inches as submitted by Stewart Incorporated. Second. Motion been made. Second all in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Number four. Uh -huh. Motion to approve special exception use number 17-SEU-02 as specified in Unified Development Ordinance Section 2.04 R10 Residential District to allow for a school in the R10 Residential District in Development Plan 17-DP-04 for Thales Academy at 11244 Holly Springs, New Hill Road as submitted by Stewart Inc. Project number 17025 dated revised 6-19-2017 with the following conditions as specified on the screen. Second. Is there with, the with the addition. Seven. 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 With addition of number seven. Got it. Second. Motion made and second all in favor. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great school. I like the one that I visited a couple times. So just want to mention, I, I'll mention that later. Okay, thank you. Latin was your first language, wasn't it, Mayor? Mm -hmm. Well, I pull cry a mama's son. Yes. You didn't think I knew that, did you? Really? You read it. Agenda item seven A, consent agenda. Unless I missed something. Seven C. 7C, Wright House. I did. Time out. Here we go. Agenda item 7C, public hearing 17, SEU 03, 07, DP 08, A02, 17, VAR 01, 17, VAR 02, the Wright House. Sean, Ryan. All right. And Elizabeth, maybe. Right. Possibly. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, this case is for uh, the Wright House Redevelopment Project located just behind Town Hall over at 102 Avent Ferry Road. Uh, the request is for a special exception use, uh, two variances and uh, several waivers, and all of those are really related to the architecture of the building so that uh, the proposed structure and the addition can mimic the uh, current architecture of the Wright House that exists over there today. Um, this is in our town village, our downtown zoning district, um, and all projects in the town village 
village zoning district do require special exception use and that gives town council the ability to review all these waivers and variances uh, to determine what is appropriate for our downtown area. Uh, so this is the proposed site plan for the project. Uh, the existing right house is in the back of the property. Uh, the house was actually built in the uh, early 1900s, so it is a rather historic home for Holly Springs. Uh, it was originally located where the village office condos are today. Uh, it was moved to this property and in 2007 it was converted from a residential structure over into the current office building that it is today. Uh, so the proposal is to uh, add on to the existing building, which is a little over 1,500 square feet, adding almost 1,200 square feet to that building for a total of approximately 2,700 square feet of office. And then a new building up along Avent Ferry Road, which will be 3,600 square feet of office space. Uh, you can see the new building is placed up very close to Avent Ferry Road within our uh, 5 to 15 foot minimum maximum setback range. Uh, and we like to see the buildings up along the street to encourage that urban development pattern uh, traditionally seen in most downtown areas. As for the amount of parking spaces that are needed, uh, in our downtown area, we have a automatic reduction for all uh, parking requirements. Uh, so you have your base parking requirement, and then if you're within 300 feet of public parking, uh, which this project is, you automatically reduce that by 50%. So the total number of required parking spaces for this project is 12. Uh, in order to go above that minimum parking requirement, you must request a waiver. So they are providing 14 spaces, so two over our, our parking requirement. And so that's what the parking waiver is for, is to allow for those 14 parking spaces rather than the 12 that our ordinance requires. Uh, this is the proposed landscaping plan. Uh, in our downtown area, we do require uh, minimal landscaping around the perimeter, uh, but we do require all of our other landscaping, such as the foundation landscaping, which you can see around the existing building, as well as the proposed building, uh, parking screening to screen the parking lot from the street, as well as our interior parking islands, uh, and all those have been provided. Uh, these are the proposed building elevations for the new building along Avent Ferry Road. Uh, this is the front elevation uh, that will be right up against the street. Um, and although it's not the front door of the building, uh, the architect has designed it to mimic what could be uh, seen as a, a former entrance uh, so that the building looks properly placed up against the street. Uh, the main entrance will actually be to the side facing the parking lot. Uh, but this building has been designed to mimic the architecture of the existing right house. As you can see, this is the existing right house. With the addition, you, can, you can't even tell the difference between what is the old and what is the new. Uh, so there are several waivers that are being requested. Um, again, this is in order to keep the integrity of the historical structure and make sure that all of the development on this property is consistent with that style. Um, I'm not gonna go into all these specific details. The, the specific percentages and numbers are all outlined in your packet, um, but it is a waiver request for building materials, uh, base body cap, variation in massing, windows and glass doors, as well as human scale elements. And then there are two variances being requested, one for each building. Our minimum height downtown is 25 feet. Uh, the existing structure does not meet that requirement. Uh, it's a little short, about 19 feet. So the addition, the request is to keep that same height as well for the new building to keep a similar height so it's all compatible in scale. Uh, with that, I will invite Elizabeth up to briefly talk about the engineering requirements for this project. Welcome back, Elizabeth. Um, this project is um, pretty straightforward with it um, being more of an amendment, um, adding this new building. So a lot of the infrastructure was already in place from previous projects. Um, the water service to the building, there's an existing service that service, serves the current building from the rear. Um, there will be a connection to the water line on Avent Ferry Road that will be made with this project. There is um, sewer service that will come off of Avent Ferry Road to serve the new building, the existing service will be maintained for the existing building. Um, with the traffic study um, for this project, we did look at what the existing building was and adding the new um, building and what the additional trips would be. It did not meet the threshold for requiring a traffic study, so it did not. They were not required to do one. Um, the road improvements along Avent Ferry Road were already complete. The curb and gutter was, however, the sidewalk will be completed 
as a part of this and um, there'll be like a plaza area as a part of the new construction to maintain that connectivity. Um, they are providing a cross access easement so that it can connect to the future MIMS park that will be along the property to the rear. And from an environmental side of things, it's pretty straightforward. It is gonna, um, it does have to meet the town's NPDES um, phase two post-construction stormwater ordinance, but it will go to the town's regional BMP in this area. Or stormwater control measure, as we're starting to call them. I will eventually get to where I transition. <laughs> Stormwater control measure. Measure. Got it. There's any questions? Was there another? Questions of Elizabeth at this point. Planning board? Ado? Uh, so planning board did review this proposal last month. Uh, they are recommending approval of uh, the waiver, special exception use and development plan. Uh, that was 8 0. Um, they did not raise any issues with the proposal. They thought it would be a good fit for downtown. Are there questions at, of this at this point of Sean? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. At this point in time, we'll open public hearing. Uh, Laura Holloman been sitting there patiently all evening. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. And again, just for the record. Sure. Laura Holloman, uh, Spalding and Norris, nine seventy two Trinity Road, Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, two seven six zero seven. Uh, mayor, members of the town board, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, I know this property is called the Wright House, but it really should be called 919 Marketing, um, who has owned and operated the Wright House and the surrounding property uh, since 2007. Uh, and the owner, David Chapman, is here tonight. Um, at present, I uh, just want to kind of mention a little bit about his company uh, for a lot of you that, that aren't familiar with it, even though it's uh, it's in our in the town hall's backyard. At present, his company has grown to 23 full-time employees and expects to hire at least five more employees with the expansion. Uh, currently, there are six offices in the Wright House with multiple employees in each office. The expansion will allow current offices to become bigger and also allow a TV production studio that will expand professional services available on site. The new building, uh, which is 3,600 square feet, will house, will house new offices and expansive conference meeting space. Uh, 919 Marketing works with national franchises including Golden Corral, Great Clips, and the College Foundation of North Carolina and has twice been named one of the 200 fastest growing private marketing companies by NIC Magazine. So I think that's something to brag about in Holly Springs uh, that this is, this is something that that has been created here and has grown and blossomed and this is a, a private investment that that wishes to build you know the first new building in holly springs downtown since 2003 that's a that's a big deal uh, the village district has several has several area plan has several recommendation policy or goals that apply to this project including encouraging uses that will generate demand for other use for other uses so for example by creating more office opportunities, this will include the increase the number of people working in the village district, which will in turn drive demand for a retail, restaurant, and other associated uses and opportunities. Attract more private investment. Uh, if I could highlight and underline this, I could. You know, this is a large private investment that that um, Mr. Chapman and his company is is willing to do and invest in the town rather than going somewhere else and saying, hey, it's been a good ride, but I could lease this out certainly, but I wanna stay here and I wanna grow my campus and I wanna put another building uh, along and help, our, and help the downtown grow and I think that's really important. Uh, another large component of, village, of the Village District Area Plan is community character, uh, maintaining and, and enhancing that town's village character. You know, I think it's no secret that Holly Springs has a very limited number of historic structures in town, and that's why it's so important to celebrate and complement these existing structures. You know, you have the Mims House and the Wright House um, that resemble traditional southern farmhouses, and that's why our architect uh, took great at attention to design and detail with not only making sure that the expansion would be symmetrical with the Wright House and not look out of place or look like, you know, just addition was just slapped up on there as an afterthought but really when this is all done it'll look it'll look symmetrical and it'll look like it was always that size and the same thing with the new building in front you know to the passerby it won't look like a 
an eyesore that doesn't fit in that over area, you know, sandwiched in between the MIMS house right here and the right house behind it, you'll have something that's that's complementary and it'll be its own kind of enclave of a special of a special area in character in, in the downtown. I think that's really that's really special. You know, Sean touched on the fact that their waivers were, were requested precisely to do that. You know, a lot of all the all the architectural requirements are really built to um, to make a traditional downtown building masonry brick, you know, something like you know the MIMS uh, building across the street from 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 town hall, and I think that would just be really out of character for that area of town, and and really kind of damage what um, you know the the MIMS house is trying to create with all the brides that go over there to kind of have a, a wrinkle in time over there with with an antebellum wedding, and then you know the right house behind it who took great lengths to move when the village office condos wanted to locate across from here and then i think the the new building will do nothing but complement that area um, so that's that's what i wanted to say and the owner is here if you have any questions and the architect as well any questions even though this is part of the public hearing it's also the applicant so i guess we can go either way how many questions of Laura? Pretty much. No, no. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. At this point in time, a closed public hearing for the discussion. Motion. Yeah. Motion. Yeah. Got it? Okay, thank you. One of four. I'll make the motion to adopt resolution 17 32, making it and accepting the findings of fact for special exception use 17 SEU 03. Variance of Development Standards 17 BAR01 and 17 BAR02, Waivers for Architectural and Design Requirements 17 WAB08, 17 WAV05, 17 WAB07, 1304, 14, 15, 06, 16, 12, and Waiver of off-street parking requirement 17 WAB 11 as submitted by Spalding and Norris PA and the town and the town builders as specified in exhibit a second motion been made and second all in favor aye, aye. opposed motion passed unanimously number two having made uh, the necessary findings of fact a motion to approve waivers of UDO section 303 C architectural and site design requirements 17 WAB 08, uh, 05, 07, 13, 04, 14, 15, 06, 16, and 12. And waiver of UDO section 7.04E off street parking requirements 17 WAV 11 in association with development petition number 07 DP 08 A02 for right house develop redevelopment as submitted by Spalding and Norris PA. Second. Motion made and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Number three. Motion to approve variance petition 17 VAR 01. Request for a variance from Unified Development Ordinance Section 3.03 B4A TV District Minimum Building Height to allow for a reduction in the minimum building height from 25 feet to 20 feet and two inches for the proposed building adjacent to Avent Ferry Road and 17-VAR02, request for a variance from the Unified Development Ordinance Section 3.03B4A, TV District Minimum Building Height to allow for a reduction in the minimum building height from 25 feet to 19 feet and 7 inches for the right house addition. Second. Motion made and second all in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Motion passed unanimously. Number 404. <laughs> Somebody. I'll get it. Motion to approve special exception use number 17-SEU-03 as specified in Unified Development Board in Section 3.03A2A TV Town Village to allow for a new project in the TV Town Village District and Development Plan number 07-DP-08A02 for Wright House redevelopment as submitted by Spalding and Norris PA project number 596 dash 05 date revised 06 12 2017 with the following conditions on the screen Thanks. motion made and second all in favor aye. Aye. aye opposed motion passed unanimously 
Thank you. Done deal. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Agenda item 8A, consent agenda, Mayor Pro Tem. Motion to adopt the consent agenda. Second. Motion to remain second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Agenda item 9A, new business, 17 MAS 07 A01, Hensley Subdivision Amendment. Sean, again. All right, so the next item on the agenda is a request for a amendment to a previously approved subdivision. Uh, this is the Hensley subdivision. Uh, just to orient you to the site, this is Holly Springs, New Hill Road. This is the location of the Thales Academy that was discussed earlier this evening. Uh, it's kind of bookend between Thales and then Oakview Elementary over on the west side of the, pro the project. Uh, the Hensley subdivision, which is in the hatch pattern here, was originally approved back in March of 2015. Uh, they have since started building houses. Uh, they are requesting to add an additional uh, two parcels to their project area, and those parcels are the ones that are highlighted in red here. Uh, so in the red square on the screen is the original approved Hensley subdivision. It was for 150 lots. Uh, it has uh, uh, 75 attached single family units over on this side closer to Oakview Elementary and 75 detached residential single family residential units on the eastern side of the project. Uh, and the area highlighted in yellow is the additional two parcels that they're requesting to be added in. Uh, it's, uh, currently zoned R10 at 10,000 square foot lots. Uh, 24 lots are being requested to be added to this subdivision to bring the total to 174 for the entire Hensley project. Uh, the gross density allowed by the R10 district is 3.25 units per acre. Uh, with 24 houses, they have a proposed density of 2.47 units per acre, so well under our maximum requirement. Uh, the minimum lot area that we require in this district is 10,000 square feet, uh, and they are proposing a minimum lot area that is just over 10,000, with the average being around uh, 12 to 13,000 square feet. Uh, all of the lots meet the minimum lot dimensions for the R10 zoning district, uh, and setbacks for all the structures uh, will be 20 feet on the front, 6 on the side, and 25 feet on the rear. Uh, this is the proposed landscaping plan for the project. Uh, type uh, A20 landscape buffer is required along the uh, perimeter of the project that's an open type buffer. Uh, along the thoroughfare, Holly Springs New Hill Road, a 50 foot type B225 semi opaque buffer is required and you can see the detail for the landscaping here. Uh, street trees will be provided along all the streets uh, consistent with what is uh, currently approved for Hensley subdivision using Laurel Oak and Lace Bark Elm uh, street trees with root guards. And I will invite Elizabeth up to talk about some of the infrastructure requirements. Welcome back. No, I said that before. Keeping us all on our toes, coming back and forth. <laughs> This project, um, again, is an amendment to an existing um, approved development, so a lot of the infrastructure is in place already, but I'll kind of walk through how it's being extended for this additional piece um, for these additional lots. So there's an existing water line that runs along New Hill Road. This project will connect to that as well as extend within Hensley to further um, serve these lots. The um, sewer service is coming from the back it comes along the road and will tie to these lots also will stub to Thales to allow for service um, of that project as well with um, this project being located in the area it is there is a reclaim service area that any non um, potable needs um, such as irrigation must be um, using the reclaim system so we have a reclaim water line that has been extended to this point with um, the original Hensley. It will be extended the next portion of frontage um, will get us very close to having um, this loop um, completed on this, this portion of the road. Um, so there's still a small gap, but we're working our way down the road with the reclaim, the 12 inch reclaim line. The um, transportation side of this, um, the original Hensley project was required to do a traffic study. We had the um, engineer go back in um, reevaluate how the additional 24 lots would impact that study. 24 lots alone does not trigger a traffic study. Um, and in um, all fairness, it's a very small impact in the, the bigger perspective, but we wanted to be sure that it did not trigger certain improvements. Um, and so that evaluation has been completed. 
However, there was not any major triggers that were added at this time. There were improvements that were required at the time Hensley came in, and they have been met at this point. Um, there will be a fee in lieu towards that same signal we were discussing, the Green Oaks New Hill Road intersection. There was one paid for the original lots. There will be an additional amount of money paid for the additional lots. Um, again, it's a very small percentage that goes that way with this particular subdivision. The um, road improvements, just as we have seen the road widening come down um, to the current end of the project, it will continue this last portion um, of New Hill. It will connect with what Thales is proposing for the um, four, half of the four lane median divided cross section. There is, um, obviously, that we are connecting the road, um, extending it. They are providing connectivity onto Thales um, in order to tie to that public street. Um, I know it's been asked why we had not considered possibly tying to the north, and I did want to point out there is a C&D landfill that has been located to the north of this property, and that is, that's the reason that there was not um, stubs proposed um, going towards that at this time. We're working on making sure we make connectivity um, east-west. This is located in the Cape Fear River Basin and is subject to our town's post-construction stormwater ordinance and um, has appropriate stormwater control measures to address those requirements as well. If there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions of Elizabeth? Seeing none. Thank you, Elizabeth. Planning Board reviewed this proposal last month. Uh, they do recommend approval, 8-0. Um, there was some discussion on the connectivity uh, with the project to adjacent sidewalks, uh, specifically uh, how it's going to connect to the existing Hensley with the sidewalks and the uh, greenway along New Hill Road, um, but also how it was going to connect over to the proposed elementary school, Thales Academy. Um, and then the board also discussed uh, the need for the stoplight at Green Oaks and Holly Springs New Hill. Mm -hmm. um, and as Elizabeth discussed, they um, are paying towards a portion of that. Any other questions, Sean? So the, the new addition, the 24 lots, that's currently zoned R10. Zoned right? R10, yes. And the Hemsley subdivision is zoned R8. At present. Scott, it's so they're split. not requesting any zoning changes. Those lots are going to be basically bigger than the others just because of the, the zoning. Yeah, so zoning this, yeah. this dashed line on the screen following my arrow here, mm -hmm. um, everything over on the uh, right hand side, this is all zoned R8 residential, and that was rezoned back in 2014. 15, 14, 15. Um, it was originally RMF 15, a multifamily zoning right. designation. So they down zoned to R8. But the RMF 15 remains on the portion closest to Oakview where the attached single family single residential family is. Day. So it's the whole project is going to end up having three different zoning districts, RMF 15, R8, and then R10. Yeah. Sean, what's the buffer on to the east uh, okay. that's going to parallel to the new road for Thales Academy? Thales Academy? Uh, it is a five foot type A20, so it's an open type buffer, uh, which really pretty much the back of every lot is going to have maybe two large deciduous trees and a small evergreen tree. Um, because the uh, because the school's property is zoned residential, our ordinance looks at them as being two similar uses. So the school actually has to provide the increased buffer, not the residential neighborhood, yeah, because that, the school was, is okay. the more intense yeah. use. Okay. okay. Which was evident by the time. Good question. What else? Seeing none. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, 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 who would I, like I, to I, tackle this yeah, one? I'll, I'll get every word. Every single one. Sherry. Right. Motion to approve preliminary plan number 14, MAS 07A01 for Hensley subdivision as submitted by H. H. Hunt Schaefer LLC, project number uh, 2016-018, revised 06-1217, with the following conditions as stated on the screen. Second. Motion been made and second all in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Or thank you, Sean, again in a minute. Agenda item 9B, new business, 17 MAS 03 Sutton Subdivision. Sean and Elizabeth. Woo. 
All right. Uh, this project is a proposed uh, major subdivision located on the uh, Sutton property that was uh, just annexed earlier in this meeting. Uh, so just to refresh our memories where the project is located, uh, here's GB Alfred Highway under my arrow on the screen here. Uh, if you come down Avon Ferry Road, the entrance to Morgan Park, uh, it's at the back of the Morgan Park neighborhood, Utley Bluffs Drive is, is this uh, street with cul-de-sac here. Uh, so the uh, property was recently rezoned uh, to R10 conditional use. Uh, several of the conditions related to architectural requirements, uh, but there were a couple that were specific to uh, site design. Uh, one of the conditions was that no lots could have driveways off of Berman Edge Road, uh, which is uh, this private road located along the bottom of the screen under my arrow here. Um, and uh, as you can see, all the lots are facing uh, a new public street. None of them have access to Berman Edge. Um, another condition was that a 20-foot undisturbed buffer would be provided along the portion of the lots that are closest to Berman Edge Road. Um, and so that 20-foot undisturbed buffer has also been provided to meet that zoning condition. Uh, also as a zoning condition, maximum proposed density was limited to 2.45 units per acre. Typically in R10, we would have a maximum of 3.25, so the uh, property owner limited their density as part of their zoning conditions. Uh, at 16 lots, uh, the proposed density is 2.41, so they are uh, meeting their maximum allowed density for this project. Uh, in R10, our minimum lot size, again, 10,000 square feet. Uh, this subdivision proposes a minimum lot size just over 10,000 square feet, uh, the largest being a little over 18,000, and average around 12,000 square feet. Um, the back half of the property, uh, which is currently zoned R30, that will remain available for future development. That was one of the things that the planning board had asked about, um, and the applicant could come up and speak more. Uh, but they responded that their intent is to keep that at R30 residential. Uh, this is the proposed landscaping plan. Uh, again, street trees will be provided along all of our interior streets. Uh, three different species have been provided to encourage biodiversity. Uh, the type of buffer that is required along the perimeter, uh, again, this is residential to residential, so our minimum by ordinance is a five-foot type A20 open buffer, and you'll see that that buffer has been provided along the perimeter of the project with the exception of the area along the back, which is meeting that 20 foot undisturbed buffer condition that was part of the rezoning. So that's why the buffers are different from one side of the subdivision to the other. Um, I will point out that a centralized mail kiosk location is being provided uh, towards the front of this project with parking space to meet accessibility requirements as well. And I will again invite Elizabeth up to go through infrastructure requirements. Not saying a word. So the engineering requirements for this project include extending a water line from um, Utley Bluff um, down the new residential street to serve these lots. Um, there's also a sewer line currently in Utley Bluff's um, drive in order to um, serve these lots by gravity sewer. Um, this project also, we looked at the number of lots and the um, transportation improvements that, that were needed. Um, it did not warrant a traffic study because of the number of lots. Um, it also did not have access on any road identified on our comprehensive transportation plan since it is nestled behind Morgan Park. Um, so they will be extending their own residential streets, stubbing for the future development of the rest of the lot, and um, adding the cul-de-sac um, internal street network. They um, are within our Noose River Basin and are um, providing a stormwater control measure to meet the town stormwater ordinance. And I'm happy to answer questions on this one. Does this, uh, the adding of the, the all these additional sewer services, does that have any impact upon existing lift stations since this is a gravity feed sewer? Does We, we do have them look at downstream sewer and um, I believe there was a sewer study done for this one and there was no um, capacity issues on the downstream lines. Um, this does go gravity to, straight to the treatment plant okay. by way of Morgan Park, Trotters Bluff, and then um, through existing gravity lines, and those lines are adequate so to no serve. additional, no impact upon the uh, Lenny Lift station yeah. whatsoever. Uh, one other question, I'm not sure you're the one that to ask this, construction traffic, or would it be, that was uh, in an earlier 
earlier this evening we had someone make public comments asking about one of theirs was the construction co uh, traffic and limiting where that traffic would be uh, what is the thought process here it is a tricky one for this one because it is nestled behind the Morgan Park subdivision we do periodically look at if there's a, um, a less impactful route for construction traffic to come and go I don't know that we've looked at the specifics of that on this one at this point um, obviously with the questions and concerns that were raised we will look at it um, it, it is something that is it, going yeah. to have to have an yeah, access I think it would be sure. it would be appreciated by the by the residents and everything since yep. it, it, there, it, it there will be some concerns. way that that needs to be able to gain access out to Ava Ferry Road and it, it's likely going to impact Morgan Park in some way but trying yeah. to do it in a minimal there's, there's no good way to get there so That's but uh, whatever whatever they can do to minimize their impacts I think I do they know the applicant is here and can is also able to hear these concerns so we okay. will work on from the construction drawing review perspective and um, with them to try and find the best so even, way possible even during certain hours would be would be helpful yeah. when moving large piping equipment and stuff to avoid morning or evening hours or just something where it would be least impactful yeah speaking from experience i mean not through my neighborhood but i know the Adjacent some of the heavy stuff that gets <clears throat> gets put back there absolutely anything else that was my only thoughts got it got it yeah okay um, questions oh, anything else yeah the um the uh, odor in that area is is there any kind of is that do we ask know. you or do we ask yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> we've got multiple departments that are <laughs> affected by this question <laughs> um <laughs> let's see how best to um to speak to it the location of this site is adjacent to the town's wastewater treatment plant facility um there are um certain things that come from being close to that facility and we have made sure that the applicant is aware and that we would like for them to notify the residents through HOA documents through plats right. um, of the proximity to the treatment plant and that there are um, noise <laughs> odors and other operations that may impact this area um, it is a it's an existing um, facility and they will be building adjacent to it. Um, it, it that's the best I think we are able to do on notifying them I don't know if there's any I mean, other fire, fire due diligence mm -hmm. fire beware <coughs> kind of. well is that a separate HOA right they have their own HOA we'll have a separate oh, I mean, HOA okay because I was out there last last night talking to some of the residents there and they don't have that in their HOA that discloses that uh, you know you're within you know a certain amount of feet of the uh, the Morgan Park PUD was approved quite a while ago yeah. and that may not have been a requirement to be incorporated into that it is something we've adopted um, through the years with properties close to pump stations um, and have kind of standard procedures of making sure the immediate homes adjacent to that are, are notified through notes on the plat that will transfer in the best way we have mm -hmm. um, into documents that they would see um, but I'm I don't disagree that it's yeah. probably not in the Morgan Park HOA documents. Right. You know, current situations kind of indicate that anytime something like this happens, it's not quite as often as maybe the other landfill issue we have in town, but they're very receptive at the plant and, and work very hard and very quickly to eliminate when we have that problem. I think most of us get an email on that showing the graph and everything else. So uh, that's the good news. That, uh, I, I know that Sean Bird with our public yeah, utilities they, they department has worked with the Morgan Park residents in trying to address some of their concerns <clears> and, <throat> and helping to work through um, that issue. Okay. Yeah, like I said, it's you know buyer due diligence, mm -hmm. and I highly doubt that any of their uh, real estate salespeople notified them of that up front mm -hmm. that this was. Uh, possibility mm -hmm. that they could smell something or that they were located near that mm -hmm. what else mm -hmm. thank you Elizabeth mm -hmm. thank you Elizabeth Again. Uh, oh yeah Planning Board recommended yeah. approval 8-0 um, and they had the same conversations that we've just had about proximity to the treatment plant oh, yeah. um, if there were any restrictions for houses being in close proximity uh, there are not um 
And they also questioned about uh, the remaining acres behind the subdivision that are uh, zoned R30. Um, and the applicant is here, they can discuss their plans with you. Um, but the applicant responded that they plan on leaving it at R30 um, due to the uh, grade of the, the land. Anything else, board? Hear from the applicant, please. You want to hear from the applicant? Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, would the applicant please come forward? Or Laura. <laughs> what do you think? Asking? I guess reintroduce yourself, Laura, if you would. Sure. And David. Laura Holland with Spalding and Norris, and I um, have Tom Spalding with Spalding and Norris. Um, he's going to speak to uh, some of the other issues that were raised. Um, but just real quick. Um, you know, I think we all know it was zoned R10 conditional use last fall. Uh, Sean went over those conditions with you on our plan and how they're being met um, as requirements. You know, this was something that that was a hybrid zoning um, that the property owner and the team worked really hard on putting together so that it would be harmonious with the surrounding area. You know, the 20-foot the undisturbed buffer along Burman Edge, that was done um, as an additional transition between the Happy Hunting Hill subdivision, which was an existing R30 uh, subdivision, and de dealing with the neighborhood meeting and the neighbors, um, their lots are in access of an acre. So we thought um, as an additional uh, good, good faith effort, we would allow them to have um, a 20-foot uh, undisturbed buffer there um, because they've... You know, that's that's kind of a different subdivision it's a subdivision but it's not you know those those homes operate as is kind of individual homesteads um, as far as the other side you know that's that's a five foot to five foot you know those are that's will have you know the subdivision will have you know homes along Utley Bluffs so you know for the for the um, the passerby um, you know, five to ten years from now, this will be a seamless transition and look like a, a just a, a typical residential street. You know, kind of like how um, the Overlook in, in Holly Glen, or um, gosh, what's that neighborhood in the very back of Holly Glen? Um, the Moors, the Moors of Holly Glen. Um, you know, you, they don't have a they don't have an expensive uh, expansive buffer. 20 foot buffer along along that are they part of Holly? well it was approved as a separate subdivision um, but yes um, so that's you know the, that's some of that's some of our our thought process for that you know this is this isn't a very big parcel of land uh, there weren't too many options in terms of design this is an existing stub road that that Morgan Park provided so it was it was pretty much we knew that this is where our our new road was going to happen in the um, in the cul-de-sac here you know Sean whenever the density that's allowed is 2.45 we're showing 2.41 you know we're we're meeting the average lot size uh, our average lot size is actually uh, well above the minimum lot size of 10,000 we're over 12,000 uh, so that's that's kind of a nutshell of, of this subdivision you know it's an infill subdivision it's um, it's allowing an adequate transition between smaller lots up here and Morgan Park here, and also being cognizant of the fact um, that there's a larger uh, lots in Logging Road with Berman Edge, and so the the belief always was uh, for this remaining area to remain R30, and uh, you know that was brought up at Planning Board. In addition to um, you know that transition, there's a lot of significant um, environmental as well as steep uh, land. So at most, um, you know, it drops off a sizable amount. So at most, you, you know, we can extend this road, you know, this way, and then have a have just a few lots. Um, that pond, there's a, a big pond back there, and that's uh, that was surveyed, and we know that that has to be a remain has to. Uh, it was it was determined that was a, a jurisdictional pond, so that has to be kept um, in perpetuity and buffered. So that you know that's it's not going to be a lot of development back there ever. So with that, I'll let Tom speak to other questions. Yeah, um, members of the council, just real briefly, um, what 
Well, first of all, uh, this, this property is owned by um, Mr. Sutton. And he's lived there for quite a long time and owned this property for what, quite a long time. Um, he actually lives on Berman Ave, or uh, Berman Way and uh, decided that he was going to um, put in a few lots. Um, Jeff Ryder is going to be the builder. And th they, they aren't <coughs> big time developers. They aren't big track builders. They are going to do custom homes one at a time. They're not going to do mass clearing. There is some area um, that has been cleared already here, but um, we've been in conversations for the last two weeks of how can we do minimum <coughs> cutting and go in and just do, you know, put homes and leave the trees in. So this isn't going to be, you know, cut them down and, and slap them up as fast as we can. These are going to be, you know, sold and customized to each individual resident. And yes, um, Mr. Sutton's lived there his whole life. He's, he's fully aware of um, the treatment plant, and that is going to be, you know, not only in the HO documents, but it needs to be disclosed at real estate time. Um, that's, a, that's a big no-no not to do that if you're in the real estate um, business. Um, other than that, um, this, this was always planned, where it is, with a stub. There was a stub street here made as part of the Morgan Park and a manhole stubbed out to this property just for this reason to be able to, you know, do a few lots. The rest of the property falls off, like Laura said, tremendously. The idea is to do some three to five acre lots back there. There's a nice pond, you know, and probably, you know, just keep it very rural in nature because of the topo. And that's the plan. Okay, questions? Is the, is the drop off dangerous? Is the drop off dangerous? Would residents, should residents be, it's, future residents be concerned if it's, they want it's, that? Um, I don't say it's dangerous, it's wooded. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just, um, I guess, a little bit more topo than you would normally see in Holly Springs. Um, you're getting slopes that are, um, you know, when we grade, when you grade lots in larger subdivisions, you get it to a three to one slope. These are probably between two and a half to three to one for some sections and then it flattens off you know as you know I'm not a geology person but you know it formed in that in that fashion there's a couple draws that go down to I think it's Utley Creek right there right. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so the question that came up earlier about the construction traffic uh, where do we see that construction traffic coming in going out yes um, forgot to address that um, so can you go back one uh, no that's all right so the streets that we're proposing is going to be somewhere around 600 to 700 feet of pavement so when we first go in and do what I would consider large construction you're going to drop off your equipment and should be able to build those roads and utility lines roughly within a couple months it's, it's not a large amount of streets from that point, now we're building these custom homes, which is a lot different than, you know, if you, if you drive out in Morgan Park right now, you might have an entire row here being built on at one time, and you've got, you know, contractors parked everywhere. It's going to be a totally different situation. The, the bad part about this, as you noted, is that, you know, you're not going to use a private logging road. The folks over in this subdivision here are not, not happy you know, with that situation and the construction traffic, there's a barricade here so you can't go out. So unfortunately, for these 16 lots, it is gonna have to access this, but once the construction from large construction gets done, it should be more of a onesie twosies for homes. I mean, we all know that those of us who lived in neighborhoods that are being developed, that construction traffic can be a huge problem, speed, um, debris, things like that, and um, I mean, this is going right through one neighborhood to another. I mean, that's a, that's going to be something that has to be has to be monitored. Okay, yeah, I, w I guess what we need to do is sit down with um, the town staff, the engineering department, and figure out a way to monitor and to you know detour 
and I know in the past, uh, engineers of the engineering department has worked with the developer at pre-con stage. We talked about hours of operation and things like that that can be established. Right. So we have an ordinance that talks about the different the times and holidays and the times which you can do usual construction. Enforcement of that is um, usually our inspectors are not here on holidays and on the weekends. So the only thing is if someone complains, um, I don't know if is here but I mean that's really on the weekends when our inspectors aren't here as far as enforcement um, but we do say we have this happen a lot I mean you think about all the subdivisions and they mm -hmm. do in phases um, they agree to a certain route whether we go north or south of the common space but that's the route in and out it's signed so that people coming in and out of the site know to use that path we usually carry a bond on that road much longer um, because we're watching it for asphalt damage. Um, <clears throat> and other than that, I mean, I think we've, like at Creekside on Sunset Lake Road, we actually closed, like where Carrington Estates is, we actually had that closed off. But for this, there's not a real way to Nothing. close the traffic. Um, it is public right of way, and I think just trying to monitor, getting them to use a route, putting a condition on the construction drawings, Monday through Friday, we can enforce it from eight to five. The and there's there's still about 30, 30 plus or minus homes still left to be built in Morgan Park. Morgan Park. The uh, the trees that uh, back up to the uh, the treatment plant. What do you anticipate in terms of how much you're going to cut? Because that's a buffer for the smell as well. So years ago, there was some minimal clearing here on these, these four lots, which right. face, the plan is right now, we, we're gonna just grade for these streets in here. These lots here and these lots here should um, remain wooded with the exception of whatever's needed to clear for the road for this cul-de-sac. Now, this, this area drops off here a little bit, so we have, got a plan where we're going to be putting some fill in here to make these better basement lots but the plan I, the, everything I've heard from the custom builder Jeff is I want to leave as many trees as I can I don't want to fill I don't want it to you know I want me to stand out because I'm a small-time custom builder and so that's that's kind of our current plan we will have a stormwater device here that will have to um, provide for detention and stormwater treatment but the plan is is to leave as many trees as we can. And that five foot bu uh, buffer uh, parallel to, I guess, the north of the subdivision there. Bluff, yeah, uh, those are custom homes that are built there. They're mm -hmm. expensive homes. Uh, Any way to, I mean, five feet is not a lot. Not a lot. It is. Um, like I said, right along here, this is a sideline for this lot. It's. It's been partially cleared. Um, certainly we've got no, this is a stream buffer that comes up here, so this won't be um, <coughs> disturbed. This is way in the rear of this lot. That's a 20 foot rear setback. And we could look at making some undisturbed up to this lot line here, but I'd really need to look at how much is left right here. Yeah, that's where the lady who spoke tonight, right. she lives parallel to that right. potential new house there. Yeah, And that's that's the old age question of, you know, making dividing lines between subdivisions or not, you know. Um, certainly we would be um, amenable to making some additional plantings there. Um, I don't think it's really the, the size of the buffer so much as the amount of plantings that you're looking for, if I'm correct. Mm. Um, maybe some additional planting. So is that is that an option that you could for that specific uh, area there? Good evening. My name is Jeff Ryder. I'm um, anticipating being the builder on this property. I've lived here all my life. I wish the residents that brought up these concerns would have stayed so they could, we'd have had an opportunity because we didn't, 
we, we didn't even know they were here. Um, the residents down along Happy Hunting Hills, we, we felt like we came to a, you know, a reason we had discussion. We, we worked it out. Um, I know the one lady said she was new to the area. I, I'm going to be here when, when this thing is over. Um, I, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a local custom builder. Uh, we're not going to build 20 at a time. I, I, I think our construction traffic will be um, much more agreeable to them uh, as compared to what they've put up with to, to this point. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, the whole reason, how do I do this? No, just move it around. I don't even see it. Am I moving this? Ah, there it is. Okay, her, her house is right here. And there's a fence along this property line, a privacy fence that we, we didn't put it up there. We didn't even want it there because we want a seamless transition here. And I'll be honest, I don't even know how they're going to maintain it because it comes within a foot of, of our property. So I, I don't know if they wanted to refurbish it. They're going to have to get our permission to do it. I mean, we'll grant it, but we didn't put it there. Um, but it does provide her some privacy and it does prevent us from, if we wanted to landscape screen it, we can't. So uh, we, we didn't do that. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have of me or us. Yeah, I wish you had stayed yeah. to, to talk yeah. to you. I do too, um, but I, maybe I, I, they didn't. Maybe we can have her reach out to you so that you can kind of explain and walk her through uh, and I, I, the right expectations and what you, yeah, you know. I, we would do that, but again, we didn't know. But, but the intensity of this, this is, um, you know, they're both residential. Morgan Park is a, a zone to a PUD. Yes, sir. So, which is probably more intensive yes, than sir. this than ours. traditional use R10. Yes, sir. So, I mean, if you're really looking at it, it really should be the other way around. Um, I mean, it, it's it's essentially, I mean, it's the equivalent of, um, I mean, it's really just residential to residential. I mean, just yes. because it's a different builder or a different development, it's, to me, it's still just residential to residential. I mean, if, there, if it was, um, you know, if you were a townhouse development right. or you were, um, you know, an R8 yeah, type, sir. Uh, type of um, development, to me, yeah, maybe. But it, it seems like as, it, as if it's uh, apples to apples. We hope that somebody driving a car by won't be able to tell the difference between their subdivision stopping and ours beginning. I mean, that's what we hope. But the fence is there. But like I said, we we did not put it there. I'll put you in touch with that lady. Okay. I got her information. All right. That's the way to handle it, I think, too. Anybody else? Doctor. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, no, no it, just, it sounds like you all do um, predict, are predicting, the, you know, there will be probably few complaints about construction traffic. And, and I just ask that you just um, sure. keep an eye on it and just. And, we're we're going to do the best. We're, we're going to be here when this thing is over we're not i'm not moving thanks i live here <laughs> anybody else thank you thank you guys thanks all set any other discussion john anything else um i can just clarify um, what the fence is on this property line. So Morgan Park had to do a perimeter buffer as part of their planned unit development. And there's a 15 foot semi-opaque buffer as part of Morgan Park that follows these lot lines. And so that's a mix of evergreen and deciduous trees. And then uh, the Morgan Park developer put that fence in as part of their buffer. Uh, because this at the time when 
excuse me, this property that we're talking about was still zoned R30. The lots that were being put in in Morgan Park were of a much more, uh, much higher intensity. And so rather than a five foot buffer, Morgan Park had to do a 15 foot buffer. And rather than a type A buffer, they had to do a semi-opaque, which is what we call type B. Um, so Morgan Park already put in a, an intensive buffer then this one was rezoned to a comparable zoning district to the lots in Morgan Park. And so that's what the fence is. Okay. We have one motion. Motion to approve preliminary plan number 17-MAS-03 for Sutton subdivision as submitted by Spalding and Norris, PA, project number 410-02, revised 06-16-2017 with the following conditions as stated on the screen. Second. Second. Motion been made, second all in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passed unanimously, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Agenda item 9C, new business, the brunch bill authorization. Councillor John Schifano. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, the uh, General Assembly has just authorized uh, municipalities to, if they so choose, to allow ABC permittees to sell wine, fortified wine, beer, and spiritus liquor um, at, beginning at 10 o'clock on Sunday or really at any time uh, prior to, to noon that the law has been that uh, since I think the mid 80s that you can't serve alcohol on Sunday before noon so the General Assembly has given you the option if you choose to pass an ordinance to allow that um, those sales prior to um, or beginning at 10 o'clock instead of noon so there is an ordinance uh, 17-07 that uh, effectuates that if if you s deem to uh, to pass it. And when would that be effective if we pass it tonight? It'd be effective tomorrow, the first tomorrow Sunday, morning, yeah. right? The, the okay. next Sunday okay. rolls around. You can you can have your mimosa and Bloody Mary. <laughs> Not at the same time. one. <laughs> oh, it was just one. The uh, the information I've gotten from everybody's called me is rather simple to explain. I've had everybody for this motion and nobody against it. Uh, I'm curious to know what else the board has heard. No negative comments that I've received. No, I've spoken to uh, a few uh, restaurant owners, uh, and they're they're happy to see it pass. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure thing. yeah, I haven't heard anything against. So. No, I, I've gotten a few emails or messages on Facebook, and people want to start drinking on Sunday morning. So. <laughs> I heard that. That's the church wine. Eat same. Exactly. Yeah. No, no complaints. No sacramental. All right. Wine. Do we need to discuss this any further? I say make it so. All right. Motion, please. Somebody hit it. I'll make, make them. Okay. Go ahead. I'll make the motion to adopt Ordinance 17-07 to allow the sale of malt beverages, uh, unfortified wine, fortified wine, and mixed beverages on Sundays beginning at 10 a.m. Second. Second. Motion made and second all in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very and, and much. Tom, you don't, you don't, cons you don't invive either. I don't, I don't donate Claire? to the, uh, <laughs> the cause. Pause <laughs> it. No, never mind. Never mind. Many people thank you. Gen item 90, new business, North Main Street Sidewalk Project, Town of Holly Springs, 15018. Great Kirk tie. Seaman Boat. Love the Kirk tie. Kirk does. Oh, good evening. Cleans Mayor up Sears. nice, doesn't he? He cleans up very good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I make it short. I know it's late. Um, I would like to present to you the North Main Street Sidewalk Project. There we go. Here's the map. What this, um, so this sidewalk would be about 2,050 linear feet, starting at around um, in front of the Oak Hall subdivision, um, would kind of like continue the existing sidewalk all the way to the North Main Athletic Complex. 
So you would be able to walk from the village district to the ball game. Um, we, the surveying, the design, and construction will be completed by outside consultants and also by um, outside contractors. Um, the construction admission um, administration may be completed by engineering department staff. So we had uh, requested and received a, an engineering design service contract from Sungate Design, um, which they would um, subcontract out the survey and the subsurface utility engineering service. And um, we would recommend awarding the contract to Sungate Des Design Group. Any comments, questions? Questions or comments? I just have one comment. We may have to have some cars removed from the front of Don's, whatever. Yeah. I know, like, anybody talk to Don? <laughs> you know exactly what like I'm here. talking about. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? No, I'm looking forward to it. It's nice to have. Uh, be nice. Just as a, as a runner, it, I'm not too yeah, keen nice. on running That's along great. Main yeah. Street. I actually, at that point. I actually walked this like a month ago when my wife said she's going to pick me up, but then she didn't show up. So I said, <laughs> I'm going to start walking to the North Main Athletic Complex. And I made it um, <laughs> on, on the, the side. Cars? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have plenty of right of way on the left side that we can just utilize and we don't anticipate to purchase any right of way at this point. Right. So it's gonna be, gonna be um, nice. These, the money, the funding's available out, out of, uh, coming out of street reserves, correct? Yes. Well, we Powell had street Bill. reserves. I think we changed the agenda item. We found out Powell Bill could be used. Powell Bill. Because well, yeah. it's contiguous in the town limits, so Powell. So Powell Bill, okay, all right. Powell Bill, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. So um, we recommend to award the contract in the amount of $101,797 to Sungate Design Group for engineering design and survey services, approved funding in the amount of $112,000, which include con includes contingency, and to approve the project budget. Okay, motion. Oh, sorry. I'll make the motion to award contract in the amount of $101,000. $797 to Sungate Design Group PA for engineering design and survey services, approve funding in the amount of $112,000, including contingency, and approve the project budget. Second. Motion made and second all in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item 9E we is one that, one that we are now just pull, skipping, skip, I guess. Pull that yes. one out. Yeah. Pull it out for tonight. Yeah. Okay. No Going to 9F, new business. Offer of sale of the 129 North Main Street, former site of fire station number one and police. Again, Councillor John Stefano. Uh, we received a written offer for uh, purchase, and according to the statute, um, that offer has to come to you um, for consideration and... Uh, if you choose to accept it or entertain accepting it, then it um, what we would do is publish an ad in the newspaper said that you are um, considering an offer to um, sell this town property um, and then any uh, interested third party can bid on it uh, by submitting a bid of uh, in excess of 10% uh, above the original bid amount, in which case if that happens, then they would need to um, give us a deposit and then we would advertise again and another 10 days would accrue until no further bids were, were allowed or uh, received. Now, this property is addressed as both 127 and 129 North Main Street. It was um, at the corner of Earp Street, North Main. It's the former, uh, served as the town hall property at one point, served as the most recently the um, public safety center. It was a police and fire station. And that was the old Holt House that was uh, taken down by Public Works several years ago. And we have recently had it appraised in uh, January of this year 
for um, 298000 two, $298, dollars. Um, prior to that, in two thousand and eight, it was appraised for about two hundred and forty thousand. The problem is, there's not been a lot of voluntary um, land sales in the downtown area, so it's it's a difficult uh, appraisal to to happen. But I do think that two not right about three hundred thousand is fair mar fair market value for this property. So the offer came in from ABC Z Properties um, LLC. And he's a local um, businessman, Abel Zalsberg, um, and, and that's his LLC. Um, to purchase that property, um, you'll you'll note that it's the former or the site of the former Mosaic on Main property that um, just never got off the ground. It was a commercial development plan that j just did not get off the ground. So I would imagine that it. Um, if you were to entertain accepting this offer and this the bid period expired and mr zalsberg was the property owner you'd see a uh development plan probably similar in nature to mosaic but different come come forth uh, which you can look at the one um thing that you might want to note or that i would note on this um sales contract um, that that's a little bit different than say a normal government surplus property sale is that he's asking for a 180 day due diligence period which is very typical um, of a voluntary real estate transaction but with respect to this this 10 day issue um, you know he would he would forfeit his deposit um, the five percent a five percent deposit um, but you know, I, I would suggest you know signing a contract with a the due diligence period, which is just very typical in real estate, and um, allows him to get his development approvals in line and and whatnot, so that he doesn't have to um, uh, be stuck with the property um, if if he can't make the use of it that he intends to. So um, you know, that's that's. I don't want to say it's atypical because it's atypical for us to sell any property, but um, it's typical of voluntary real estate transactions that there's this due diligence period that gives him an out to not purchase the property. Um, I believe there were people here from ABCZ if, if you want to speak as to the um, anything, but um, you know, I, I don't, there's not a public hearing requirement at this stage for, um, you know, entertaining the offer of sale. You good? Good? Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions of council? If not, next item would be, <laughs> so there it is. Okay. Motion to accept purchase offer of two hundred ninety eight thousand dollars for one twenty seven slash one twenty nine North Main Street property and proceed with sale of property bid process second motion been made in second all favor aye. aye opposed motion passes thank you unanimously okay <laughs> item 10 other business uh, I have one or two things Number one, progress is still being made on crosswalk safety. We're not done. I watch it every day, and it's better. Trust me. Uh, we're not there. We still got the face. And if you're doing nothing more important than having some fun on Saturday, come to Farmer's Market. Once again, we're, we're having that event. I think it's called Founder's Day. Am I correct? Founders day. Yeah. Okay. And we will have a tent there for the anti-bullying crusade, which continues on. And again, we're making some progress on that. So stop by and we'll get you a free wristband and maybe a sticker and a few other things. So uh, I will see you guys then. Next. I, like many people, attended some of the uh, Coastal Plain League All-Star yeah. uh, festivities between the uh, Home Run Derby, who was won by uh, Young young man who's six foot seven <laughs> inches tall. Little fellow. Um, you know, and the, as well as the All Star Game itself. So I think that was a, a big coup for Holly Springs to get that event. It was. Yeah, it was great. It Holly. was a great event. Good attendance, and it was just fun watching the kids out there playing. They uh, had, had a lot, they had a lot of fun. And that it was you know people could watch it on you know 
that MLB, MLB yeah, yeah. network and MLB.com and so it's neat. Yeah. I still like the Savannah bananas, but never mind. <laughs> what else? Good, good, good. Manager's report. Uh, I would only add the uh, in terms of the All Star game. I think it was the second most highly attended uh, All Star game in Coastal Plain League history. I think they announced that. Yeah. Um, and uh, that Major League Baseball network reaches up to 25 million households. Uh, it was pretty cool. Justin um, contacted uh, a couple of us the night after the uh, All Star game. I think they were taking sort of a victory lap, he and his, uh, his family, and they were at the theater. And while at the theater, um, at the cinema, on the uh, TV, one of the TV monitors had the, the Coastal Plain League All-Star Game being televised the day after. So that's pretty cool. He was showing it live uh, on his phone. He was, he was walking around the stadium with, an, with his phone saying, you know, there it is, there it is. Yes. That's um, Justin Sellers, who's the commissioner. Go ahead. Yeah, the commissioner of the Coastal Plain League, yes, sir. Uh, and you, you'd mentioned uh, Founders Day at the Farmer's Market this year, and that's also Town Information Day, so we'll have a number of booths set up uh, with various departments represented. So if you have questions about upcoming developments, uh, you know, it's a great opportunity for, for, for residents to get out and to, uh, you know, to ask questions of our staff because we will have uh, – have folks at the at that event that's all i have counselor nothing they can't wait till next time <laughs> thank you sir may i hear a motion <laughs> motion to adjourn sir all favor aye. 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 thank you for staying up thanks chief <laughs>